Hello and welcome back to another episode of Real Talk with Jordan Shafranik. We have been fortunate enough to be joined by Ishmael Bernkante of the Norwegian karate team, who is a European bronze medalist. And also, just get it out there, our first international guest. So, round of applause for taking the time to come on. So anyway, anyway, how have you been? How have you been? How, how's, how's lockdown, pandemic and all that over on Norway? Mm, it's, it's quite, I don't know. We're in Norway, we're in a kind of a special situation where we right. actually like, we handled everything quite well in the beginning. Uh, so a couple of days ago, I looked at it and like June, July, August last year, we had like maybe like one case, two cases a day. Wow. So it was like nothing. So actually life was normal back then. Mm-hmm. But then it started, um, I don't know what happened, but it just started blowing up. And um, yeah. now we're not in a bad situation, but it's just that they're taking, I think, I mean, yeah, a, lot, a lot of pre- precautions. So we've been locked down in Oslo uh, since like November. Oh, wow. Which is about five months now. And um, yeah, it's getting to all of us, to be honest. Um, like training, like gyms are closed yeah um unis are closed shopping centers are closed everything is closed to be honest so only thing we've got is essential services but um yeah you know you need to we need to adapt to the the situation um there's no point in just there's no point in just sitting down and hating life although that happens and that happens to me as well like a lot of times but it's just about that too you know you need to adapt I, I, have you been able to, like, I should say, adapt and like find new things to keep you going all that? Because obviously, we're kind of just sitting, sitting about all. Because it's the exact same as us. We've been locked down since December, and it's only like within the past week, two weeks that actually restrictions have started to ease. But I know for me, mm. like, especially in the beginning, motivation was high because we were like, oh, it's only going to be a month, a couple of months, or something like that. So like. Training was good, everything was good, but as everything started to, like, the whole world kind of started to go into lockdown, you started to lose motivation for, like, training and stuff like that. Have you been able to, like, obviously keep motivation in aspects like that, or have you struggled as well? Not really. The thing about it is that as more and more time goes by, you start to forget what you were doing before. Mm. Yeah. So now, now the days are just going by, and I had this conversation with somebody I know a couple of weeks ago, and I was asked, "What do you really do in a day?" And then I couldn't really answer properly. Yeah. Because I, I don't really know what I do. Like I, uh, I go to work. I, I do a bit of uni work. That's like that's about it. But there's 24 hours in a day, and that doesn't take 24 hours. And exactly. it's not like I sleep 16 hours a day either. So <laughs> the thing about it is that you just get you just get used to not doing anything which is not good at all actually but it's just that everyone yeah. has their i think their way of coping with the situation and um i think a lot of people can relate to that we don't really know what we're doing absolutely i, I couldn't agree more because i like, i've had similar conversations and like you you kind of get stuck in a rut almost because you're probably in the same as boat as me like you, like you could either be working from home or doing uni work from home and that kind of like consumes your day and then you're just kind of sat there because you've got nothing else left to do. It's like you're not in a routine almost. Exactly. Mm. Like, the, like it's been difficult to almost break that at times because like there's, there's nothing really to do. So like, I think for me, like, it, it really affected me. Like Because obviously as athletes, we are used to having like a set structure. Like we used to go to training at this time, come back, have a rest, exactly. back to training, do uni work, do this, do that. But now we're kind of just like, right, we'll do uni work, but what what, mm. what else are we going to do for all day? And it's, as you say, it's, it's kind of giving you a new perspective. Like it, it definitely has for me. Like it's, I, it's kind of giving me a perspective of what actually makes me happy and what I actually want to do with like myself in life and like just the, the things that I want to accomplish because I, I, I know... Like going exploring, going like traveling, adventures like that. That's like a big thing for me. And like getting t- that taken away, it's kind of like almost like, oh, I-, I need to try and fill that somehow. Like in Scotland and probably Norway is the exact same. Like you don't realize how beautiful your con- your own country actually is 
until mm. you're kind of locked in it. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. But yeah. I saw, um, but Scotland has some beautiful places, man. Yeah. Because I came, I was, I was there in August of, when was it? July, August of 2019, I think. Yeah. I went to visit Adam. And we um, we went to Sports Direct. We bought ourselves a tent, bought ourselves some sleeping bags, and it wasn't like a good. It wasn't like a good tent. It was just like a round one that you just open the zip and then it just pops up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we bought a lot of stuff, put in Adam's car. And if you've seen Adam's car, it's just like a small like two seat or something like that. And for some, and for someone like you, like that's <laughs> the most cramped thing it can be. <laughs> but it was vibes, man. We went to Sky. Um, Amazing. And it was literally one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Yeah. So um, definitely, you're lucky, and we are lucky as well in Norway. We've got the same, like, yeah. kind of the same nature and stuff like this. So yeah, I'm thinking I, like yeah. think about the people in, I don't know, like say places that don't have stuff like this. And exactly. How they're coping? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, because like, we are, we are used to, like, we can, like, almost just escape, right? We can kind of go out of our city and you're kind of just escaping, like, the nature or, like, the wilderness or whatever. But, exactly. right, it's difficult for, like, these people that are stuck just, as you say, with exactly. kind of nothing. Like, I've, I've got, like, a forest, like, five minutes. If I walk, like, for five minutes, I'm inside, like, deep inside the forest. Yeah. And I can just walk around and find beautiful places I, and stuff like this. So it's... Would you say, like, that's something that's... That you've used to like cope during like the lockdown, like not a not not oh. a lot, but sometimes like I yeah. do it sometimes. But it's just that like what I said before, it's like we've come. I've I've gone into this negative cycle of life. I wouldn't call it like it's not depression. It's nothing like that. But it's just like you know, same old, same old every single day. And then uh -huh. when you're gonna try, when you're gonna try to snap out of it, it's so difficult as well. Yeah. Because yeah. because. Obviously, a routine is hard to break when you've got a routine that you've been doing for a long time. And this is the routine that I've had for the last couple of months. Like since November, I've been doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again. And it's a very, like, it's very difficult to get out of it, which is not yeah. good at all. But yeah, I don't I, know what if. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like it was like for the second lockdown so like i'd probably say like july august time like i, I was in the exact same boat and all that. Like, i struggled to even just get out of bed every morning because i'm like i don't have any competitions like training like you can keep training but it's difficult to have that goal that 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 thing to keep you going every morning like it just kind of like a snowball effect i'm like well what what is it i do i'm like and then i just struggled to get out of bed just Doing like the simple things that you almost take for granted, and exactly. yeah, I, it's difficult. That that's kind of why I, you know I started like all those challenges and all that. Like at, uh, the start, of, like that was like Lo the, love those. By the way, I love mean, those. Yes. Love those. Like that. That was like the reason behind that. Because I'm like, if I set myself a challenge, and like, I put it out in like social media or something like that, then I kind of need to it's get kind up. of account accountability, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I kind of just need to get up and get on with it almost, which is what we usually do as athletes anyway, but we've almost mm. taken that for granted. So, like, that was, like, the reason behind doing all of them. I'm like, right, we are used to pushing ourselves to our limits. We just kind of, as you say, adapt and find new ways to do that, which mm. it's easier said than done. And for some, for some people, like, even the simpler things, like, they should almost have, like, respect for themselves for even just accomplishing those little things because mm. it's as you say it's difficult to break that cycle oh, like what like how how were you able to like break that cycle obviously like we may not have like, like <clears throat> but what what helped you or what helps you mm. it's a very difficult question to answer when you're in that cycle at the moment yeah so um obviously i'm very grateful i've got um i've got a job that i can go to every single day so um that's like something that i have to like i have to get to work at 2 p.m and every single day and i'm there for five hours and i do my work and everything um so that's a very good thing that i've got in my life at the moment but i there's i know a lot of people are just sitting at home who's not doing anything because then they're like they're laid off of work i got laid off for my previous job um just because of what they said was pandemic issues yeah. but um 
and then I walked I walked around for a month not really doing anything and that was like in the middle of like January I think it was like it was in January February I was not doing anything either and then in March I got that new job so I'm very thankful that I've got that which is like a routine thing yeah but it, it kind of ends up being like I wake up like around this time maybe and then I don't really do it a lot so maybe I sit on my computer yeah uh, try to do some uni work that's very difficult at the moment as well because like literally you've got like no social interaction with anybody else doing the course with you yeah. uh zoom Especially. doesn't really replace it and yeah, yeah it's Especially. like a different kind of it's like a new thing that nobody really knows what to do about yeah and um i'm a person that likes routine like I'm, yeah. I, I'm not the best at getting i'm not the best at having routines like i wouldn't I won't wake up at 5 a.m. every single day. I won't do that. But if I've got like a routine where I do this and this and this, and that was very, very positive as well when I was doing my training and I was doing my competing, I like, I had, it was like accountability that I needed to be at training for 10 a.m. And then I needed to do, give my 100%. And then I go home and I rest and recover and eat. And then I'll get back to training. And that was a very like nice way of living the life. <clears throat> but nowadays, it's just difficult. So I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to do one thing at a time, to be honest, because if you, if you're putting like a hundred, like a hundred goals at, at the same time, you're never going to, like, you're never even going to start with one of them. So um, obviously I'm a person that likes to, like to watch YouTube, like motivation, TikTok, stuff like this, like, yeah. like not, not obviously the, the funny stuff on TikTok as well, but a lot of like motivational stuff on TikTok as well, where people do like challenges and obviously your your thing as well, where you where you do like a new challenge and stuff. But it, I just find it so difficult to start them. Like I'd, I'd save them, I'd like them, I'd put them like in my folders and stuff like this, but then I just forget about it. Yeah. And maybe you can you can help me with that. I don't know, like what, yeah. what, would you, what, what, what goes through your mind? Like when you say, say for example, you see a, you see a challenge on Facebook, for example, Instagram, like David Goggins puts out a 30 mile challenge for 30 days. Say that, for example, what do you do? Well, I am literally in the exact same boat as you. Like I save it and then I think about it. I'm like, I want to do this. I really want to do this. I, I know it's going to benefit me. I know all the things it's going to do, but I see starting it, like, it is honestly the hardest thing. Like, mm. I, like I've put it off and put it off. It wasn't until it was like, the start of the new year when I was like, right, it's a new year. I knew that like, you've got a full new 365 days. Why not just start it then? Throw yourself in. And then if you do it, great. If you don't, then you've tried. So like, I always like use like a challenge of like, say like a new month or a new like start of the week or something like that. You're like, right, it's a fresh, a fresh month, a fresh week, a fresh day. You've got a full 24 mm. hours, a full seven days. Why not try and do one thing for those seven days? And then as you say, like, it's almost like a snowball effect. If you say you, you say to yourself, I'm going to get out of bed at this time, then I'm going to you do that for a week. Then you slowly build it up gradually and gradually and gradually. And then you get to challenges that push it. But the, the, the thing is, you, it needs to be something that you enjoy doing. Like hmm. I, start, I started out with those runs. It was like a 1K, then a 2K, then a 3K. Like it was easy stuff. So like, I, I I could enjoy it. And then hmm. as it got progressively harder, like, I'd already done this small stuff to get my confidence to like almost start it. I'm like, well, I've I've went two weeks. Like <laughs> <laughs> I was I was I was, I was I was thinking to myself, when's this going to end? Is he going to be running like 200 kilometers when it gets to April? I have no idea. Honestly, mate, I'm like, thank God that. Thank God I picked February because I couldn't be bothered doing 29, 30, 31. I was like, February, 30 month. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's all about like picking. Starting small. Starting small and picking stuff that you enjoy doing. Like, like, as athletes, like, we kind of run smaller distances. We don't usually run, like, large distances. So, like, that's why I started off small, kind of getting into the small stuff I could do and I knew I could, like, almost build my confidence with. And then you just slowly push yourself more and more and more. Mm. But the, the, the main thing is finding stuff you enjoy doing because a couple of other ones, it's, like, like to do with, like, climbing mountains, like, in weights fests. And all that, and like I enjoy climbing. Like I know 
at the end you're going to get like amazing views and all that so like that's it's not i wouldn't really class it as a challenge the only challenge is ha- adding in like a weights fist or something like that and mm. like the, the end goal that you're going to get is it, it, going to be good but yeah it needs to be starting off something small that you can build your confidence up in and something you're going to enjoy doing or you're going to see the benefit because there's no point running 300k in a month and then you're like i didn't enjoy that or Hmm. yeah because i think i think the thing about like us as athletes we're very used to being on like the highest level of things so if we're going to start something we want to start something that is really really difficult yeah and that's a that's a problem that i have like I had a workout the other day, which was like the first workout I had in a couple of months, just because of like sheer laziness, not just not just yeah. putting the time and stuff like this. But then when I did the workout, I I went all in. Mm. Like I do, I do like I literally like go all in because that's the only thing I know. If you understand, absolutely. But this is like a new situation, which like we've talked about before, which nobody really knows what to. We, yeah. do, we don't really know what we're going to do in this situation so maybe yeah that's maybe a smart thing to do like to start maybe go back to the basics i think about the time like yeah. a couple of years ago when i like i didn't need, i didn't know how to punch didn't know how to kick didn't know how to do anything of like like that and back then we did start from the basics so maybe that's just what i need to do now to get like back into back into doing stuff and yeah. maybe and something like this it's it's almost like setting yourself goals of what you want to achieve because see, see before i started those challenges i i looked up crazy challenges on as you say like youtube tiktok and all that and i'm like have, I'm, you, see, have you seen that have you seen that 75 hard what one's what that you, you'd go 75 days and then you do one workout inside one workout outside every single day and then you're only you're not allowed any cheat meal cheat meals for 75 days and if you fail, like say you fail on day forty nine, you go back to day one. Yeah, I'll send I'll send you a link. Of, I'll send you a link to it. That is crazy because see 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 that see see for me being a cat athlete, like, I don't I don't really what I wouldn't say I don't watch what I eat, but I can have a cheat meal. I can have this. I can have that. So I, and as as a heavyweight, that's what I would do as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, like even like not having a cheat meal is like something difficult. Like, oh yeah, exactly. that, that, that'd be a crazy one because I just, like, you <laughs> almost just need to keep yourself accountable and just keep going like that. That's yeah. the thing like, that I enjoyed, see, because like, with my challenge, I put out every single day. I, I know some people are probably like, oh God, here he is, posting another, completed another run or something like that. But for me, it was like to hold myself accountable that I'm like, right, if, if people don't see that I've not posted, then I've not mm. done it. Some, some, somebody's going to think that you haven't done it yeah exactly just, just and, one person even yeah and like that's that's like the one person that, <laughs> like you kind of want that almost because like that's going to keep you going you're like right if someone's going to pick up on it i need to keep going i need to keep going but it's it's all about like setting yourself goals because like i just put like like noted down on my phone like crazy challenges like one thing i've always wanted to do is run a marathon so i was like right new year first of july why not? Why not just get out the streets of the streets exactly. of Glasgow and just run a marathon? Because never done it before. Like it's something I've wanted to do. So it's it's fine about it's all about finding stuff that you want to do first of all. Mm. Write them down, and then you don't you don't need to accomplish them straight away. Like you can ease into them and all that. But as you say, like mm. as athletes, like right at the highest level, we are used to just pushing yourself. Just that's used why to just pushing. That's why I used to just expecting like the best results at once like exactly you can go like i if i get back into the dojo now and i train for two months and then they say yeah you're going to go to european champion i'm going to go there and think oh, i'm going to become european champion it's not going to be true yeah obviously but but that yeah that's that's, that, that's, that's what that's true. what we do that hmm. that's a mentality that we've created for ourselves but as well those things where see because we are used to being in the environment of training so hard we kind of like we we don't take it for granted, but we can kind of know that if we went to this competition, we'd be ready because we'd done it for years previously. We'd put ourselves in. Mm. Like we kind of like with these like challenges or something like that, we just expect to be able to complete them straight away. Whereas, and the, 
and I think a lot of times when I see when I see stuff like this, I'm just, I'm like, ah, that's for normal people, man. That's it's just like for some, yeah. And it's just like the ego inside of me that says that because I look at it and I'm like, oh, this is hard. But then, like, subconscious says like, yeah, nah, that's just for you. You've been through worse. You've done worse for a couple of years. You don't need to do this challenge or something like this. No, that that yeah. that's completely what I'm like. I'm like. That's why I'm like, I'm oh, running a marathon. Oh, that's easy. Why not just stick a 10 kilo weights vest on? Never ran over 5k in my life. Hadn't trained for a marathon. And here's me going out, run a marathon in a 10 kilo weights vest. The ego was just up there. And I'm like, as athletes, like, we may not we may not have the ability, shall we say, but we've got the confidence, the dedication, the perseverance to whatever's thrown our way. We can almost rise to the occasion and just find that extra gear to keep pushing which mm. is what i felt like i lost during like the lockdowns because mm. we we're so used to doing that and like that's the what, the thing that i loved most about the sport like i was being able to push ourselves so like that's why i try to find challenges that i'm like people think they're crazy or i may not even complete some of them but it's having that like you know yourself that you can push yourself to your limit, which is what we we've, we've been used to in training the full exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like, exactly. do do you think like being in like a training environment surrounded by <laughs> other people helps you, like push you to your to your limits, or would you say you're able to find that yourself? Because obviously, I'm a cat athlete, so like I kind of need to train on my own at times. So like, I need to find that myself. Whereas with a fighter, you've got, most of the time you've got a partner. To train with and put, mm. have you push? Do you think mm. like there's a difference in that? Definitely, in some ways. Um, so, like, obviously, this is like in no, like normal daily life. If there's a person like, if you walk into a room with like a bad mood, there's like ten people in there that are in a bad mood. You're going to be in a bad mood as well. So it's the same in a training situation, to be honest, uh, when it comes to like sparring and dr doing drills and stuff like this. Uh, if you've got someone there that's motivated and wants it as bad as you or even more than you, then it just makes you push that extra, 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 whatever, yeah, able, extra yeah. minute, extra technique, extra everything. But, um, but when it comes to, I think it's a lot to do with your individual character as well when it comes to pushing yourself, because there's a lot of times you're not doing, it. we're not sparring every day. We're not doing drills every single day. There's a lot of times we're standing by ourselves, punching bags and like literally in a position just to like perfect that technique and stuff like this. And that's where it's just you and yourself. Yeah. It's just you and yourself. And if you're not able to push yourself to your limit, then yeah. that's just going to affect you because you're the one that's going to go and fight. Yeah. And you're the one that's going to know at the end of the day. I think that's one of the worst feelings that you can have, knowing at the end of the day that you didn't give your everything for something that you really actually wanted or you told someone that you wanted because maybe you didn't really want it for yourself. It's just maybe someone else wanted it for you. Yeah. And then you go there and then you don't achieve it. And then at the end of the day, you're like, oh, maybe I should have wanted it more. Maybe I should have trained more and stuff like this. So when it comes to karate and becoming a better karate athlete, uh, martial arts athlete, whatever, a partner is very, very important. And a partner that can actually motivate you to go on more, who'd call you in the morning and say, oh, let's do a session, let's do this, let's do this. But when it comes down to it, it's you and yourself. And there's a lot of not pretty things that happen like behind the scenes that nobody knows about, about our training. And you'd know that as well. Like you'd stand there for six hours doing the same kata going over and over again in the same sequence. Yeah. And we we do the same in our way. Like we do circuits. We do this and this and this. And when it comes to that, nobody's gonna know if you go ninety percent or you go one hundred percent, except for you. Yeah. And that's one thing that you that I was. I think I think I managed to get to that point uh, quite early that I knew that what I do, I'm going to keep myself accountable for it. Yeah. And I, I need to go 100%. Whenever I go, I go 
if we're if we're going to go 100 percent, obviously and i'm not you're not going to be stupid and do 100 percent when you're going to actually going to have a light session if you understand what i mean yeah no definitely <laughs> it's one of those things where you need to train smart which sometimes it's difficult especially for younger athletes because they go into like say an environment where the, the training's maybe not tailored to them like they mm. kind of have like maybe a session where it's not their favorite stuff or anything like that and they feel like they can almost back off and and that's going to be see that and i see that all the time like yeah people if we're if we're doing a <clears throat> if we're doing kizami gyaku for example a punch to the like, just the gyakuzuki a lot of people hate that gyakuzuki and i hate it as well don't really hate it but you understand it's what i mean it's, it's it's not my favorite thing to train yeah. on but it's it saved me a lot of times in fighting yeah. without even knowing it's been like instinct but it's the worst thing to train because you actually need to look at all the details you wake up the next morning you're like sore at the front of your shins your your sore places you never knew you could be sore before yeah. and then you hate it and then the next time you the next time your coach says uh oh, today we're just doing yakuzuki and you know that it's a two-hour session and you're doing yakuzuki for two hours you're like oh man i don't want to do this but that's where you're actually developing so much more than you are when you're sparring or whatever because when you're sparring or when you're fighting you go back to what's safe right what you've done a lot of times yeah um when you're competing probably in kata as well like you if if you're in a stressful situation you'd go and they ask you oh what's your next kata you're gonna go oh, okay i'm gonna do this kata because that's what you're safe on exactly that's what you've trained and that's maybe that's what you like to train and i like to train a lot of different stuff than just doing a gyakuzuki but when it comes to it, at the end of the day it's about that it's about developing you need to do all of these things that you don't really like to do just to yeah so like, you can do what you like to do later absolutely. do you understand what i mean yeah no definitely because <laughs> I, as you say i i in sport like you you're going to get thrown in like unpredictable moments where you your banker stuff may not I'm not saying it doesn't work, but there could be situations where you need to do something else and you've you've hated all the hours of training this, but it could be that one time that you need it and you've been exactly. able to pull it out and it's going to save you. It could be like the last 10 seconds. You need to score three points, for example. You, you don't usually like kicking, but because you've trained it over and over again, like that, that exactly. one time it's going to save you. It's going to throw you into the next round. It's going to get you a medal. It's going to get you this. It's going to get you that. But... It, it, it's almost coming down to you may you may hate doing a yak, but you need to find ways of enjoying it. So like you may hate actually doing the yak, but you can have like little goals of I want to focus on my speed because I like focusing on that, or I'm going to focus on the power. I'm going to focus on my movement in. So instead of like focusing on the yak as a whole, you can go and break it down and and have yeah. like little goals. To, to help you your overall fighting because if you're working just your move then that's just going to have that's going to carry over into other techniques whereas if you just say oh i'm just doing a yak tonight then you're just going to think definitely, definitely. and that's and that's up to you because your coach is never going to say that oh. exactly he might he might do but you might find something that he doesn't really think about when it comes to exactly that technique or whatever so you need to you need to find like stuff that's individual to you and but sometimes to be honest it's just some sessions are just you just think they're pointless you hate them but that's when it's important to give 100% because that's show, that shows who you are it shows that Excellent. shows that you really want it to be honest because Excellent. if you pick and choose what you're going to do then at the end of the day you're not going to be someone that's yep. people are people are intimidated by people are if they see like my name on like they're going to fight me and then they know how I train and they know that I'm a person that takes days off and takes extra days off because you need to take days off but takes extra days off and only only trains that one Kizami and stuff like this then people are going to be like all right this is easy work I'm going to prepare for the second round yeah but exactly. if you're that person if you're known as being that person and you don't even need to be known as it but let's just say yeah you're known as that person that actually gives everything they have every single session whatever it is that's going to make a big difference in how people perceive you and how you see yourself as well because then you know that i can do this for two hours i've been through the worst of the worst of the worst what's three minutes going to be yeah 
what 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 new is this going to bring what do you understand what i mean uh, absolutely and <clears throat> it's almost i uh, see see for me <clears throat> when i'm in the gym and say like, i'm doing sprints or i'm in like my last set of deadlift squats whatever i'm like well would like the, the person i go back to because like they're, they're, they're like quite a beast in the gyms like goktas from turkey i'm like would he give up in this last rep? Would he give up in this last sprint? Like, if I if I push myself, I'm going to be closer to him, then it's going to have like a knock-on effect almost. It's going to build your confidence as well, but definitely, it's, also, definitely. it's also going to show that confidence <clears throat> on the mat because you're going to be as prepared as the, 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 the person that you may think or they may think a lesser opponent almost. But mm-hmm. if you go in... Being the exact same physical like capability position as them, it's all going to just come down to your confidence at the end of the day. If if you know you've worked, you've done everything right, then your confidence is going to be up there, and that that's key, especially like individual sports. Like if you go in with a high confidence, like it doesn't matter who you go up against. Like if you've got that confidence, then if it's your day, then you you can take out anyone. That's, that's what that's what we see as well like with these countries like turkey iran france these countries japan they've got that confidence high and there's some people there that really they can only do one or two techniques when we're talking about fighting yeah. they can only do one two techniques but they do those one two techniques with that high confidence and it yeah. may not be the best in the world but it actually does win fights and it wins championships yeah. and everything yeah. and that's just because they I don't know, they believe that they're the best. And yeah. that's a very important thing as well, because going on to like the mental part of it, that's equally or that's even more important than all the physical work. Like what I said about, are uh, you going to do that Gyakuzuki for two hours? You're going to do that three times a week for four weeks, for example, because we're in a period when we're not competing. And then if you go on to, the, on to fight and then, you're actually ready physically and you're better than a lot of people physically, but then it's that mind that stops you. Yeah. <clears throat> and that happens. And that's happened to me so many times. And it's, yeah. I don't really know what it is, but it's, <clears throat> if <laughs> it's a bit difficult to say, um, but it's about, I don't know. You need to, I'm a person that I doubt myself a lot. Yeah. So I'd, I'd do all the work in the gym. I'd feel on top of the world. I'd go from the gym and say, "Oh yeah, I'm world champion. Um, I'm 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 a world champion. I'm I'm that that's how good I am." And uh, and I would know that, or I would believe that, which is the most important thing. Because um, an, anyone can be world champion at the end of the day. Um, exactly. On the on the right day. But exactly. You know, you know what I say? Like you know, what I'm saying like after a session, I'd go, "Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm world championship quality. Like I'm world champion quality." But then I'd go back home and then it would like, it would ease off a bit. Nah. And then I'd sit on the plane and then I'd, I'd go to, say, for example, World Championships in Madrid. I had a very good preparation. I'd sit on the plane and then the doubt comes in. And that's something that you actually need to learn how to deal with. And yeah. I think I had such a short career that I never really learned how to switch that on, switch that off, how to deal with it properly. Um, and you'd get down there and then you do a, a session down there and you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm world champion again. And then you'd get there on the day and then the doubt creeps in and then suddenly you're not yourself anymore. Yeah. And that's me. Like people wouldn't know. And now people can know cause I don't fight anymore. Um, but that's me and that's i think that's that's what's broken me so many times like i'd go out on the tatami and then i'd just not be sure of myself and you wouldn't you wouldn't see it like maybe you'd see it like in the way i fight and stuff sometimes because you'd see oh this is not really him if you really know me yeah but afterwards i'm like oh why like why would I do that and why would I doubt myself that much? But it's just like a natural thing for me. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because I put myself to a very high standard and I really want to follow that. And then when something goes wrong, then I get that feeling like, oh, this is this is not going to work out. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, self doubt, man. It's a it's a difficult one, and it's there's so many like so many times where I felt beforehand I felt like on top of the world, and then afterwards, just everything goes wrong because I don't I don't really know why, and I don't really know how to cope with it. But then it's just happened because I've doubted myself. Like I've been like, oh, okay, so yeah, it's a difficult one. No, I, I'm 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 so glad that you said that because it's something that I I've personally. Like, I've I've been doing this sport for twenty one years and it's still something I struggle with. Like as you say, like you can have one ama- like you can have like, weeks of an amazing training session, then like you get up to it and you're like, was what I was actually doing right? Like, mm. is it going to have that effect? And it's one of those things where if you go through a period of you have maybe not got the results that you've wanted or you've not put in the performance that you wanted, it just has it like makes that it so much worse as well on effect yeah and <laughs> it's kind of going back to like the way that we're feeling right now it's like you're kind of in a rut almost and like you don't have that confidence mm. to even do the simplest of things like taking it on to like a large tatami right like yeah, yeah, almost but it's exactly <laughs> like you just doubt everything like i like i like 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 we'll take the world championship in madrid for example like i had the exact same feeling like all the lead up amazing training going well got there confidence was still high <clears throat> training again was going well everything was firing physically i was great technically mentally that's thing like mentally i was great then kind of got to the day where like there was like a queue outside so it was like it took like maybe an hour and a half to get in and like you had like maybe a 35 40 minute warm-up and like i'm used to like an hour and a half two hours so it was like that kind of threw me and then like it kind of had self doubt. I'm like, did what I do in the warm up? Mm-hmm. Exactly. It, like, exactly. did I do enough there? Because obviously it, it was different from what I usually do. I'm like that kind of just <clears throat> crept into my performance, and like I just never performed. Like it, it was simple as that. But at the same time, everyone was in the same boat, so I can't make that excuse. But no, but no, no, but but obviously no. But you were you were in that boat as well, and yeah. it's just about how how you solved it. And the thing about it is that we think that the world is perfect for everybody else but not for us yeah. that's something that i'm very like i'm like oh I look at other people and i'm like oh how is that how yeah. how does that look so clean how does that do you understand that technique how does it look like that good how does he have that how does he have that and then I'm, i look back at myself and then i'm not feeling the greatest maybe on that day and when you're competing that much you, you're never gonna yeah. unless there's like major major championships you're never going to be peaking you're just going to be like yeah. on it all the time so you might go two three competitions in a row where you're not actually feeling that well when mm-hmm. you're warming up and then you look at someone else you look at uh, someone else that's maybe you'd say that you've beaten before mm-hmm. and then they're looking great and then you're like oh I'm, I'm not looking that great and stuff like this and then you just think everything else is a perfect world and or well, that's what I do as well, at least I think everything else is a perfect world and then that I'm like the victim in all of that that I'm like just like yeah yeah it's a, it's a difficult thing to comprehend because the, the thing that we need to like actually like look at like we are competing at the highest level in our sport like the people there like they're at the top of their game like you don't get any better like it's one of those things where like because we're from like a small nation almost like we almost I don't say I don't feel like I don't belong, but like looking at it, you're like, wow, how am I competing with these people at times? But Sometimes, the thing yeah. is, they they're at the top, like we're at the top of our sport. Like that's something like you kind of need that's, to say it yourself as well. Because that's exactly the same thing that happens when you go to a, or for example, when I go to a like when I go to a national championships in Norway, and I know that I'm not feeling hundred percent, but I know at the back of my mind, I'm like, ah, oh, this is. This is not going to be difficult for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna win this. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let in any points and stuff like this. And that's not me being too overconfident or arrogant or whatever. But it's just that that confidence that I have there is what other people have at the next stage. Exactly. At the K ones, for example. Yeah. At the, and that takes it takes time to build up. But it's just that yeah. I don't know. The mind is such a complex thing like it's gonna it's gonna trick you it's gonna yeah and yeah it's like that it's that it's like a circus lion like yeah it's a lion 
in a cage and sometimes it's sometimes it manages to escape the cage sometimes it doesn't sometimes it's just sleeping sometimes and you never know yeah. what situation you're going to be in yeah that, that, this is a thing that i think athletes need to this is a thing like we'll take social media for example that people don't actually see they're just going to see the end result yeah. they don't see all the peaks and the troughs the roller coaster the highs and the lows like the the traveling across the world for three minute fights exactly <laughs> like people people don't unless you're in that environment people don't realize the toll that it takes like especially like, as you say like we don't it's not like we're playing 90 minutes of football and you get knocked out after one match we are there for three minutes if we if like if we get knocked out, we get knocked out. It's as simple as that. Then yeah, we're stuck in the stadium that. for seven days. If if it's a world championships or something like that, and that is the most depressing seven days of your life. I tell you that. Exactly. And everyone else is as everyone else is making you feel like you need to be depressed as well. Because <laughs> everyone else is because at the end of the day, like I'm I'm a, like a very complex thinker, right? Mm. So I'd I'd think overthink a lot of things, like yeah. not when it comes to situations and stuff like this, but afterwards mm. and before and stuff like this. But my mom told me, like, she was like, you know, there's only three winners, or that there's only four winners. There's only one one guy that gets gold, one guy that gets silver, and two people that get bronze. And I thought about it one day. I went to a competition. I was like, oh, there's so many people here, and out of these people, thirty of these are gonna get a medal. The rest of us, <laughs> the rest of us are going to be sitting there. We're going to be depressed all, all together. And we're going to be on the plane home and we're going to go home and work again and then try the next time. Do you understand? So it's Absolutely. it's a difficult, it's a brutal, brutal sport. It is. it is. And it, I, like the example that I take is, like it's not like one of a team sport where you can give yourself a 70% performance and your team can give 100% and they're going to carry you through. If you if in the, if in our sport you give seventy percent performance, that's you out the door. That's your three minutes over with. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So like, it's, it's 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 going back to like what you put in is what you're going to get out. If you give your if you give that hundred percent in training, and you take that onto the mat, then like, there's no way that like physically there's no way that you can get beaten. Like mentally, exactly. you can have those highs and lows, but if if you get that right on the day, then there's no reason why. You've given everything before that you can't get the result that you want. And because like, we've all we've all seen it as well that days where everything works out, yeah. You're yeah. Like, like, you're, I, exactly. Like I, like now the cat I feel like the categories are so spread. Like with the t- people that are meddling. Obviously, you've got your people that are kind of consistently meddling in your categories, but you've got yeah, so yeah. many random nations just popping up. And that's just down to them having the confidence on day, like not going up against mm. Agf or the Costa and being like, I've got Agf or the Costa. You just go in and you fight, like you're going mm. to fight. You, no matter who who the opponent is, you just fight your fight. And I think that that's what people. It may be difficult, like over the years, like going up against these people. But if you don't have the confidence going in that you can beat them, then that's you already lost. Like you kind of mm. can't focus on that. You need to focus on and trust in your ability. Of what you've done, and it's it, it doesn't matter who you who puts in front of you. If you have your day where everything clicks, then you can put Aggie. If you can put Erkan, you can put no matter who who's in front of you. Like exactly. But as well, it's difficult to get that confidence. Like, like well, it's just it's just to, like to anyone listening. Like, it happens to everyone. Like I told I told you before that it's <clears throat> I haven't I haven't figured that out. It's a it's a random thing if I've got a good day or a bad day. I'm yeah. trying, like I've I've talked to people and I've gotten help and everything like that, and I've tried, but at the end of the day, like right now, I don't I don't fight anymore. Like just disclaimer, I don't fight anymore. I um, I made that decision to step down, not fighting anymore, not trying to go to the Olympics, stuff like this. Um, I've had like I had a couple of dreams lately where I've um, where I've actually like gone back and started training again and stuff like this. So maybe. Maybe, no. <laughs> but when I was fighting and I was fighting like nearly week in, week out for four years, um, everywhere and against everyone and all of that. And I was doing that as my job. And even for me, that was, I was a professional athlete and I did not have things like that figured out at all. Like I'd, I'd achieve some stuff 
here and there and I'd have good days and I'd be good people. But there was chaos in the middle of all of that. Like literally I was, there's a lot of times where I've like doubted the dream and a lot of things like that. But that's when, that's when it shows you if you're really supposed to be doing what you're doing or not. No, absolutely. Because I got, I won, uh, I won European bronze in 2018 and um on the 21s and uh, after that i had a terrible season yeah. terrible season and until this day i think to myself i'm very very harsh with myself but i think to myself did i win that just because everybody else was having a bad day yeah. do you understand what i mean and i've never told this to anyone before because everyone's like oh yeah he's european bronze medalist he had it figured out that day and stuff like this but i doubt myself and i tell myself did I really deserve that? Or was that just because everybody else had a bad day? Do you understand what I mean? No, no. I, and I had that. And I had that. I had a really bad season after that. And then that just made me consider and be like, oh, was that really deserved? Am I really on that level? And stuff like this. But you just need to. And that's something I've, I'm struggling with as well. Like being proud of what you've achieved. Yeah. Like being proud at the end of the day. I've done that. I've, I've done that. I've done this. And maybe it's some things I haven't achieved. I never got to the Olympics. I never got a world championship medal. Um, I never medaled at a Premier League, but I was, I was there, man. And I was, I, I, I represented like my country at the highest stage and I was trusted by the Federation to have that as a job. And I was selected for everything. And they literally invested so much money in me because they believed in that dream. And I can't, I can't take that away from myself. Like I can't, sit there and say to myself that oh, I might have gotten that medal because other people were having a bad day or it was just like a glitch in the matrix or something like this that this is all of this is real and we deserve like we deserve deserve all of this that we've done and what we haven't achieved yeah, yeah we haven't achieved but it wasn't meant to be yeah. and that's just how it is yeah I, I, I it's such I, it's a thing that I feel like a lot of athletes go through, but it's one of those things they don't know how to comprehend it. Almost like you, you say this, but it's one of those things like how like you have those feelings, but how 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 do you overcome that? I, 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 it's such like an ongoing process where <clears throat> I feel like even athletes at the highest level in other sports, they, they struggle to find that. Like, mm. but, but going back to the point of your Europeans, like, yeah, you can have one performer who's had a bad day, but you went through five rounds of of people at the top of the sport. Like yeah. you can't ride a bad wave for the field. No, no. But De definitely not. But it's just you know, it's just that thought that you have. Yeah, it's just that thought that you have that like, I've, afterwards. I've, it's like, yeah. like I've spoken to other people and they they had the exact same reaction. Like they won, they had huge success on the European or world stage, and they had and not a successful season in their eyes the thing is like in their eyes they didn't have a successful season but the the, the thing is like because you reach such a high level you're like right i'm expecting it every single week but the thing that you need to look at was the europeans was probably the most important competition that year so you peaked at the right moment so like, you're going to mm -hmm. think you're going to want to ride that wave the full way for the full season which as athletes you're, you're you're going to want because you want you want to have that feeling of succeeding the full time, but you have done it when it mattered. So like everything else, you can you can kind of take it down because mm. it's not as important as what like because I like Norway for example, they they're investing your money for a European or world medal. They don't care what you do at this comp that comp. They, they want mm. the recognition of you meddling at a European or World Championships. So you've peaked mm. at the right one. So like everything else in between, it, do, it doesn't really matter. But obviously as athletes, we are like, we just want to go out and win. We've put in this so much time, so much effort to get here. And then when you go mm. out first round, then it's like, shit, did what I do there actually, like, was a fluke almost? But it's going back to like, you almost need to trust the process. Like definitely, like definitely. You, you you trusted the process all the way up to the Europeans, and it worked. So you kind of just need to reset, 
go back to zero and then build that process yeah. again. Because yeah. there, there, there's no point focusing on each competition like, every single time because you're not going to... I, you're not going to get the result every single time. Like you, you see that in the podiums. Like if the podiums are varied every single time, and that's down to athletes peaking for different competitions or doing something like yeah. that. It's a difficult thing to comprehend as athletes because we want to win. Right? It's as simple as that. We yeah, won't yeah. we won't go. That's, that, that's, why, we're yeah, that's exactly. why we're there. Yeah, like, exactly. That's that's why I've put in all the effort. But it's one of those things where on the reflection after the competition, you kind of need to take the positives from it and focus mm. on the next one, which is the most difficult thing because going back to like the World Championships in Madrid for me, like I couldn't take the positives at all from that. Like I was like, like this is it. Like I can't I can't do this anymore. Like, I don't want to compete in the sport or that. But I'd already booked when did, when, when did you when did you compete in the world championships? Was it a Monday? Was it a Tuesday? Was it it was it was the first day, whatever I think it was Tuesday. <laughs> so like I had a full week of sitting at a stadium, like, oh god, why am I here? Because I, I fought on the Tuesday as well, and maybe one of the like, maybe one of the worst performances in my life. And I was there from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Left on a Monday, and I was just depressed. That like that, that's the thing. Like, it's not like. We've competed. We can take ourselves out of that environment. We can reset and all that. Well, You're there. Like in there, seen so many people that put in, this is the thing, like you've put in the exact same amount of effort, hard work as a person that's got gold. Like you can't doubt that. It's just, it's worked on the day for them. It, and knowing that you've put in the exact same amount of effort and hard work and it's just not clicked, it's, it's probably like a worse feeling because you've seen them succeed. You've seen all your teammates mm. succeed, which isn't a bad yeah. Obviously, but you're almost like, oh god, like why couldn't that be me? And then you're just sitting there, like overthinking, like what could have been, what what should have been, and all that. And yeah, yeah, it, it's environments. Like, you, it's, you, a, it's a difficult one. It's a yeah. really, really difficult one. Like, so like if you've done it for so many years and you don't really know, you still don't know what's going on. Right, that's, that's no way, like no. Like, absolutely not. Like, like, <laughs> 2018, like, I, 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 I was like ready for packing it in. But as I say, I'm Shanghai booked already. That was in three weeks' time. So I was like, right, confidence, all time low. If I can go to Shanghai, where I know those people in my category from the world, if I can go there and perform, then I know I belong in the sport. Then I know I belong on that stage. And it happened. Like, it was one of, like, it was just a switch. I got to like the third, fourth round of like a Premier League. Uh, that I'd never like done well on before. And I was like, I, I, mm. it just gave me the confidence. And I went on to have like such a successful 2019 season after mm. that. But if it's one of those things, like if you didn't almost pick yourself up from a previous competition and just be like, right, forget about it, move on to the next one, then they're just gonna have that effect of Yeah. That. And that's that's happened. And it, the thing about it is that those those good competitions happen so rarely. Yeah. That it's like maybe four, five, six competitions in between each time. Yeah. So that's what's that's what's yeah. difficult there. But um, yeah, it's about resetting, and we we had a lot about this when uh, when I was training with Wayne um, Wayne Otto, obviously Norwegian national coach, uh, like Legend. very successful athlete, very successful as a coach uh, for Norway at the moment and the past couple of years. Um, but we, he had that thing where he said, you reset. After every round, you reset. After every point, you reset. After every competition, after every day, after everything. And then, and that made me just think, okay, all right, we need to start resetting. And then it, it wasn't five, six competitions in between every good one. It was maybe two, three competitions, and then I'd have a good one, and then I'd have an, have an okay one. And then it just changed, changed that perception of yeah. everything that, not everything, not everything, what's it called? Um, not everything is connected in a way. Yeah. Like yeah. What, you competing in China and you competing in Paris a month later, it's not really connected. Yeah. You're going to fight in China and then you're going to reset and then you're going to go home and then Paris is a new one. And then it's a new one. It's a new one. It's a new one. And you can't really, as well as you can't dwell on your past mistakes and your past losses, you can't dwell on like your past successes either because that's not guaranteed as well. 
Yeah. So every time it's just a new one and then you're just doing the same work or you're doing your hard work at home and then you'd go and you try out, you, you try you try your techniques and you'd you'd fight and then maybe, maybe it would be good, maybe it's not good. Do you understand what I mean? So yeah, it's about no, that reset that you need to, you need to understand that this and this, they are not connected. We're, we as athletes, we fight maybe, we compete maybe 20 times a year. Is it something like that? Yeah, no, something, I, I, something like that 20 15 20 times a year uh with breaks and everything and it's 15 20 new competitions yeah. it's not 10 competitions in a row that have anything to do with each other exactly. in our in obviously in our in our case because we're not trying to qualify on points we're not going to try to be grand winners of a premier league because we're yeah. not there yet we're still yeah. young and we we're just trying to do our best absolutely and then just trying to yeah that, that, i think this is a thing that younger athletes have difficulty coping with whereas young younger athletes I, you tend to go on like maybe a winning run of right you kind of like win a lot of competitions and you're like almost like oh I'm invincible and then when you get on to like under 21 seniors you realise that you don't have those days every single time so it's almost difficult for athletes to reset because they're so used to winning at such a younger age that mm. I, it's difficult to almost wrap your head around that reset button because you're like, well, I was winning at that age. Why, why am I not winning at this age? And I think this is a thing that younger athletes, they kind of need to develop more. Maybe not, maybe not early. Like it's, it's obviously going to be a learning curve as you, as you progress in the sport. But if they trust the process earlier on and don't get frustrated then they know that they're going to have success. The success is going to come, and mm. it's going to, it's going, you're going to feel even greater, like that sense of accomplishment when you get it because you've had those times of bad competitions. But you almost need, to, as you said, not dwell on it. You need to take the positives from it and put that into the next one and refuel yourself to progress to say, like, oh, well, I never got through the first round at that competition. Be like, well, new competition. Why don't I focus on getting mm. through the first round or you do x y and z techniques or you score by six nil don't get scored on it's you need to set your, it's like it's like what we spoke about earlier of like me setting like small goals to like get your confidence started you need to do that definitely individual definitely. competition like say you had a bad competition and that was down to like you always got scored on so this competition go in and be like well i got scored on six times in the previous one why don't i try and work on getting scored on just twice or and you have those small goals because they're going to yeah. build up and build up and that's, and that's so important for some someone like us that are from smaller nations where like maybe maybe your spot on the team is not that threatened yeah you understand what i mean like if if we'd been speaking and we'd been on the iran team there's <laughs> there's i'm not joking there's literally 50 people ready there to take your spot i heard that like at the trials for like say heavyweight and heavyweights usually maybe one of the smaller categories yeah. not by much but it's a bit smaller there's like 160 people that are going to try to fight yeah. try uh, to uh, get that yeah. one spot 160 people and we um, i was in that very i was in that situation where nobody was really threatening my spot i was threatening my own spot like if i if i didn't really if i didn't perform or didn't perform in training and stuff like this then maybe we would have talked about me not going to a competition or something like this but that's what you and that's where what you were talking about is very important that you set yourself small goals and you look at a season in the whole like if you've got a notebook and you say that okay paris open I'm going to work on this, I'm going to work on my distance and stuff like this. And then you do your best fight, but then you just have that one extra thing that you're thinking about. And then you'd go to Dubai and then you'd go to Salzburg and then you'd go to Europeans. At the end of the day, at the end of the season, where you've maybe fought at the highest level, maybe 10 times, you're sat, you're sat with a page or two pages where you've actually made so much improvement. Yeah. And then the next, the next time you can be like, okay, I'm going to work on two things at the same time. And then... I'm I'm 100 percent sure that's what maybe Agayev's done. He's fought for so many years yeah. that he's got that those pages. He's got everything into one, and he can go. Okay, I'm going to focus on this and this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. But us, for example, me, I was very fresh going into seniors and everything. I'd never really fought as a junior. Uh, just had a year as a or half a year as a junior. But w me going straight into the seniors, 
I was comparing myself to the elite people who'd been doing it for 15, 20 years, who'd been fighting at the highest level for 15, 20 years, but I'd just been there for two, three months. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So that's maybe if I'd done that, maybe it would have turned out different. I don't regret anything I'd done. But Absolutely. Do you, yeah, you understand? I completely agree because you look at the podiums <laughs> and all that, the people that are on the podiums, they are late 20s, early 30s, with the exception of like Diaz and Sanchez, or just freaks of nature, or 38 and all that. So we'll, we'll, we'll take them in that equation. But it's a sport where you almost mature. Like, it's not like football where you're going to age, where if you get slower, that's kind of your, like, you're not going to do as well. Whereas in fighting, for example, or kata, you may get slower with age. But if you're technically smart and you've been able to work on everything over the years, you're going to find a way to win the fight. If you're slower, mm. then you're, you're going to find a way to like compensate with that. And that's the thing where with our sport, you're almost mature and you learn from every single competition like that you go to. Like if, you, if, you, if, you, if you sit back and you're like, oh, well, the result didn't go my way on the next one, then you're not going to learn, you're not going to progress. Like, Definitely. You're not going to progress at the rate that you want to because you're going to have these Twitter competitions that you've not taken anything from. Whereas mm. say, all these athletes over the years, they have they may not have found a way at the very start, but they've kept on working on it and working on it because and now they're at the top of their game. Like, it, it, it's a thing, like, it's obviously <clears throat> what all relatively fresh into like the senior category whereas as you say they've been there for 10 years so we've not seen them in their journey their process they probably weren't winning all their competitions straight away it's just that they've chipped away every single time and built their confidence built their repertoire of techniques up and now they've they've faced so many losses or they've faced so many wins that they can almost find a way to win now because you look at Aga yeah. like he like back in the day he was winning 8 nils. he was kicking sweeping doing everything, but now he's older, like, his joints aren't as mobile, like, I've seen him in Basel, and <coughs> he had, like, ice packs on, like, five different Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that just, that's just taking its toll on the age of the sport, but what he does well is he, he focuses on getting that one, that two points, and just defending that lead, because he knows that's all you need to do, like, that's all you need to do in a fight, you just need one point to get you through to the next round. Exactly. Like, you don't exactly. need to the flashy stuff that he done earlier on in his career, people still going to remember that. But to win now, you need to adapt, and mm-hmm. like it, it, it's almost difficult because we've not had as many competitions as them over the years to realize what works, what doesn't work, working the weaknesses here, and that's going to build there. So like, it, it, like it's difficult for us as athletes being like, I mean, why can't I just be like that? Why can't I reach that high level straight away? But you don't realize that. These people have been in the sport 10 years more than us and mm. they went through the exact same process. Yeah. <coughs> and going back to that as well, because it's like you, there's a lot of people, like if, if you're not in a system that's built on, say like a full-time system that I was a part of, yeah, and you're just trying out everything by yourself and you don't really know what you're doing and maybe you've got a coach that's, maybe not at that level or he's not really seen it all and everything and then if i go i've been to clubs where i see that the training is not there's no structure in the training and i'd go in and they're just doing a hundred different things because that's what they've seen on youtube yeah you've seen you've you've seen those agave training videos where he's in belgium in that (laughs) summer camp and he's doing like a hundred different things um obviously that's not how it is because i when i was in I was in a training camp in Rome and I and I got the chance to train with Iran. Oh wow. And um obviously Iran are I would say they're the they're the greatest men's team oh. in these recent years. Yeah. Like you look at them and like you see as a team, like a team usually performs as a team and they don't really perform individually. But all these they people, all perform they both individually titles. and team. Yeah. Like <laughs> they won they became world champions in 2014. 2016, 2018 as a team, uh, which is very rare nowadays. Obviously, Great Britain used to do it before. Yeah. Shout, shout out Wayne Otto if you're listening to this. Then um, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I trained with them, and 
literally it was the same thing the whole session was just the same thing just drilling those those one two techniques and i was training with push up and uh obviously got a bit intimidated push ups um scary oh. man but <laughs> <laughs> but I had a session with him and we just drilling like the Kizami and the block and the counter the whole time. And when I went back from that training, like what I was expecting was something totally different to what I went through. Because yeah. that training was, it wasn't difficult for me. It was like the environment was difficult for me, yeah. but the training was everything that I'm used to yeah. from Wayne at home. Yeah. And that's what, that's what people maybe make that mistake that they do too much and then when they get into onto the tatami, their heads are chaos because yeah. they have no idea what to do. Yeah. But me seeing world champions who, this was 2019, and they'd just become world champions two months earlier in the team yeah. in um, Madrid. And I got the chance to train with them. And me seeing what they're doing compared to what we're doing, it just made me think like, okay, that's that's what they do. This is what we do. It's very, very, very similar. Yeah. And that's this. That's what. And as you said, it's the simple things that win. Like that's what Agiev does. Sajad, for example, he does. He does a couple of things that are great. Yeah. And there's a couple of things that he does that that he doesn't do that he's probably not great at. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. You know what I mean, yeah. yeah. Like it's just about finding that finding that balance and then doing those that training that that is specific for exactly those things that you want to do on the tatami and not doing too much because I'm not a kicker. I'm not going to go and do 10 sessions a week with kicking if I'm in the middle of a season. I might do it during the summer when I'm preparing for a new season, but that's not going to work for me. If I'm going to go to Paris in three weeks, that's not going to work for me if I start training my Uro in exactly. the beginning of January. Mm. Yeah. yeah, because you, you, you've got your bank of techniques. Why, th why throw a kick? when exactly you don't, you don't need to that's not it's not a technique that you usually score with this is a thing like i feel like maybe as younger athletes where they kind of get flustered or they kind of want to show off almost and mm. they, they wonder why why did i get caught or why did i lose that fight when they didn't just stick to the basics of what they need to do to win a fight first of all and what they do well because uh, every, everyone's got the exact same techniques like in the sport like there's there's it's not like football where people can make up like a new a new trick or something like that everyone does the exact same techniques it's all about finding what works for you taking it back to basics and just building it up and like mm. as you say it's it's down to the intensity that you that you train at because you can train these simple techniques but if you're not putting in the intensity the like the actual way you're going to use it in a fight then it is pointless doing it because mm. it's, like, you're not you're not replicating what you do in a training environment to an actual competition environment. So like, if you've got Iran coming at you, then you're, you're, it's not going to be the exact same as a training session back home because it's like, oh, well, I've done, I done it like that. It was slow. It was this. It was that. How come I can't do it against Iran? And it's like, <laughs> well, you're, you're not training it in that environment. It's the exact same as Kata because, like, there's so many cats. There's like what a hundred cats on the WKF list. So we've got so many to choose from. But you see people like seeing Diaz or Kuna, for example. They're like, "Oh, I want to do that cat because that's the one that's winning." But the thing is, it's winning for them because it's the way their body's made up. It's their mechanics that work for them. Like a cat for Kuna doesn't work for Diaz, and vice versa. It's the exact same as us. Like we need to see what works for us. It's the exact same. Course, as, yeah. like, you need to see what works for you and you need to focus on those individual techniques and build that whole kata up. And then once you get there, then it's going to be a bank of kata for you almost because it's, mm -hmm. what, it's what you know is going to work for you. It's what you know works in the sport as well. So it's one of those things. It's, you almost need to train smarter, not... It's, like, it's one of those things where it's quality over quantity. Like, you could have a massive two-hour session, but you kind of monotone the full way. You don't have like the intensity of the highs and like the rest, the highs and the rest. Like you're better having an intense thirty-minute session where you're pushing everything and all that, and it's going to replicate a training environment, like a competition mm. environment. You're better having that than just a two-hour session where you're going at fifty percent 
or something like that. But obviously, as definitely. We, well, as you say, like, you sometimes need those sessions to like reset or work on like little technical tweaks. But the the way you're going to progress the most is when it's going to be like a real life scenario in a competition. Mm. Like you can't, mm. you can't, you need to replicate that as much as possible because like I could do a kata. I could go through it in quarters or like at seventy percent speed, working all the technical aspects. But if I don't, if I don't do that full out, if I don't put that all together as one performance, then I can't take it onto the mat because I've I've not trained it in that way. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so obviously we've spoken a lot about like the mental side of competitions, but right, what what what's like your journey been like within the sport? Like, how did you like start out? Wait, when did you start? Like, mm, I, me as a, I as a lot of other people started very young, mm. or not very young, but um, my dad's, um, my dad's a black belt in karate. He's a third dan Shotokan. Wow. <laughs> so um, uh, obviously his love for the sport is, um, he's still there, and um, it was still there when I was a. Uh, when I was a child, so I think when I was four or five, I put on my first gi um, with my white belt, and I was um, I was down in the living room uh, doing punches and um, yeah, just learning about karate and uh, stuff like this. And I think as a child, you're not really you, you don't really know what you like and don't like, uh, yeah. to be honest. So you're just doing it just because you're told to do it. You don't really have a free, you don't really have a, anything to say about it. So um, obviously da- down in the living room, I graded from my 10th queue to my 9th queue. Amazing. So I uh, got, got my yellow belt from yours sincerely, my dad. Um, and um, then we got put in a club, um, which was uh, like a traditional Sotokan club. Um, no mats, um, no action, no nothing. It was just... I don't know if it I don't know if it's because of the sensei was I don't know whatever but I hated it yeah and uh, went there for a couple of years but didn't really get anything out of it uh, didn't really feel that it helped um but a couple of years is, was actually a lot of years so I was I was there for a lot of years but I just didn't feel like I had a say and I thought like I need to be grateful because my dad's my dad's putting all this effort in to put me into karate and maybe it just switches and I like it one day or something like this, but it didn't really happen. Um, so um, I quit karate uh, and then went to, I was playing football at, uh, at the same time, but quit both of those because I, I knew that I wasn't going to become a football player mm. and um, didn't really see anything with karate going anywhere didn't really know anything about karate like competition wise or anything like this so I had no idea like I thought karate was old school Okinawa you stand and you're punching for two hours and then you'd go back and forth um so I didn't really have a really great relationship with the sport um but then um but then um my sister my younger sister um she also went exactly the same path as me uh she started in a club um that does competition karate right and um she's quit now she's she doesn't do karate anymore she doesn't she didn't really like that kind of karate but um i was i went there with my dad once just to pick her up and i saw i saw what i thought wasn't karate being trained if you understand what i mean Yeah. yeah and um it was something like i I thought it was very like exciting and I thought, okay, yeah, I've got, I've got a base in this. I know like, I know how to kick and punch and stuff like this. So I talked to him and um, I talked to the coach and he was like, yeah, yeah, you're welcome to come down and train. And yeah, we do competitions. We've got Norwegian champions. We've got this and this, you know, when a club, when a club is going to talk about what they do. Yeah. And I was like, wow, wow. How, how is that possible? Can I, can I, can I come? Can I do this? And he was like, yeah, yeah, just come. And I came down to training one day and I loved it. And I was, I was obviously I've been given the physical properties. Um, I'm, I'm tall. My arms are long, and it didn't really take a long time for me to actually get into it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was like 
end of 2014 was when I was back at it. And I was, at that time, I was so motivated. I would train every single day. Didn't really know what I was doing, but I would just train every single day. Like I said before, I'd watch the Agaev videos on YouTube and I would, I would do exactly what he was doing. A load of just random stuff, but I was just so motivated. And um, 2015 Norwegian Championships um, was the first time I went to compete uh, uh, as a junior uh, yeah. and I became Norwegian champion, junior heavyweight. After one year? <laughs> after, like, no, no, after, literally after like five or six months. Wow. wow. It, was, it was like Feb February 2015. Yeah. Um, became Norwegian champion and um, when you're Norwegian champion, you get, um, you automatically get selected for Nordic championships, nice. which are Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and some of uh, like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Wow, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big, it's a big tournament. Because I just, it's, it's I just quite a big tournament. Yeah, because I just presumed it was obviously like your standard Nordic countries, like Norway, Sweden, I, Finland. Yeah. But wow, it's quite, it's quite a big one. So it was, a, it was in Iceland. I was, I was invited to go to Iceland to go and compete, right. and I was on top of the world. I was like, yeah. oh, this is, this is so cool i got i got a couple of days off from from school as well like to go and compete um so i went there and you know at the time i was very mm, i didn't really know a lot about like the mental side of it i just thought oh this is fun and i'm just going to do this yeah, and i know how to do this, this technique yeah. yeah and and that actually really helped me at that time because I just do techniques because I th think like, oh, this is the right time to do the technique. I didn't really have that much knowledge like, I, I, to yeah. overthink stuff. Yeah. So um, uh, I fought um, I fought a couple of rounds and I ended fifth in a category of like ten people, I think, uh -huh. which was it was. I was obviously disappointed, but looking back at it, I didn't really. That was yeah. that was the yeah. best that I could do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was your first um, one, like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it was my first one. And um, Wayne was there as well. Obviously, I was coached by my uh, club coach yeah. who came with me because that's what we do when there's a lot of people going. Nordic Championships were like 40 people from nowhere that go or used to. Mm. Um, but Wayne was there and um, I talked a bit to him and I was like, yeah, can I come down and train? I didn't really know about the situation. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, I got invited to go and train um we had like a Wednesday training where everyone would in like the Oslo community would go and train together and it was a high level and mm. I'd train and I'd try my best and everything. And um, from there, I got to go to like national squad trainings and I'd uh, do my best there. And I wasn't really, I wasn't really there technically. I was all over the place. And yeah. at the time I was like maybe 81 kilos, 80 kilos. So you'd, I was that tall yeah. and I was this skinny and didn't really know what to do with my arms and legs and stuff like this. Okay. But yeah, I got called up and I trained and stuff like this. And then, um, and then uh, one day there was like a, they had like a presentation of a full-time setup that was going to happen if karate got into the Olympics. Wow. And they were like, yeah, you're going to live in Norway. You're going to get an apartment. You're going to, you're going to live in an apartment that the Federation has rented. You're going to get some money. We're going to pay for your trips and everything. And I was like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. Yeah. That's what, it's what every athlete wants to do. Like, yeah, that's, this is what every athlete wants to do. And I was like, this has happened in a year and I, I've got this opportunity. And then um, obviously I applied for that. We had like physical tests and stuff. Didn't really do well on the physical stuff uh, because I wasn't, I wasn't an athlete. Yeah. Um, I was like, good at running though. Natural ability, which is what, which is yeah, what, yeah. It, was, it was something, it was something that they saw in me. And then yeah. in May sometime I got the, um, I got a message saying, yeah, uh, we want you to start from August or from 1st of September when it's moving from England to Norway and we want you on the full-time team. And at the time I was like, wow, this is going to be my opportunity to do something. I'm going to go to the Olympics. I was like, wow. Um, and since then man it's been a journey and um yeah i went i was i was a full-time athlete for nearly four years um it was uh, i think the first of may last year was when i when i quit yeah. um 
Um, but yeah, four years where I learned so much about myself, about everyone around me, a lot of people, um, got to know a lot of people, uh, had the greatest memories. And it was, it's actually been crazy. Like when I look back at it from where I started in November of 2014, and to actually to where I ended up, I would never, ever have accept, expected any of it. Um, but as I said, like I put myself to that high of a standard that I would, yeah. that I expected a lot of that of myself. But if you look back at it and when I'm actually talking about it, I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this is, none of this was like granted. There was nothing like me going into that dojo in 2014 and just training with, with some people that I thought were, oh, these are Norwegian champions, champions. These are, these are, yeah. yeah. And then to me being where I was before I, um, to be, to me being where I am now, there's a lot that's changed and karate has given me, man, it's given me like literally it's given me everything that I, or a lot of what I have right now and a lot of what I'm bringing with me to the future and all the memories, like literally me, I can scroll down on my phone for like m like half an hour and there's pictures of memories and us sitting in Madrid at our hotel room playing FIFA. And exactly. It's, it's the simple the, things that you, you remember. Like, it's, you remember it's all your of that. Like, yeah. when you th like when we're talking about performance and we're talking about mental stuff and everything like this, that matters. But what really matters in the end is everything that you've gone through and all the experiences you've had and like, what I've seen, I've, I'd, I would never have thought that I would I would be able to see. And I was so privileged to travel the world for free. Like, mm. it's actually crazy, like, to all the places I've been. And what I needed to do was just to put in an effort in training and in competition. And I got all of that yeah. back, to, or I got all of that served, served on a silver plate to myself. So it's actually... Oh. Yeah, but it's that, actually crazy, man. That that's definitely like you got that self to you, but that's definitely like the like your work work ethic. Like you wanted it. You you put in all the hard work. Like mm -hmm. the thing is, like people see you get like a full time career. Like you made that your career, but they didn't see like the hard work. I think you had to put in previous to that to get to where you were. Which... And I'll tell you something, like if there's a lot of people I know that if they came into that dojo the 1st of September 2016 when I started as a full-time athlete and saw what I was doing <laughs> like you no know, what what Wayne put me through for the first couple of months mm. a lot of people would have just walked out the door and said you know I'm not going to do this because mm. it was literally I was standing there learning how to punch and kick as an 18 19 year old man like literally Everything that I thought of myself was just out of the window. You're yeah. starting from here. You're starting at zero. You, it's nobody ever told me you can't fight. You can't. But I realized I was like, okay, yeah. I'm in way too deep. <laughs> I just need to build myself up. I just need yeah. to. Do you understand? And it was a lot of my, like the start of the start of my career uh, as a full-time athlete, it was not pretty. It was yeah. a lot of technical work and a lot of boring work. And, but it paid, it paid out in the end. And I'm sat here, like if I do a karate session now, I'm hundred percent sure like my technique is there and stuff like this, maybe, maybe not the cardio and everything, but, but I've, yeah, I've it's like, a lot. And it's something that you can like, you, you keep for years and years yeah. and years after you finish as well. I, obviously, that that could have been, as you say, difficult for so many people to comprehend going out of that environment and almost getting like teared apart, like everything teared apart, like that you thought you knew, almost. But the thing you need to realize is, you wouldn't have been there if the coaches never seen something. Yeah, they wouldn't win, win. Like I can imagine Wayne, he wouldn't put in the hard work, the time with someone if he didn't see them getting to where he believed they can get to. So it's almost like. It's difficult at the time, but you almost need to take it as it's constructive. He's there to help you. He's like he just wants you to do well, which is difficult for athletes. Like no matter if you're in a full time position or you're just doing it like out of the love of the sport, like the people aren't there to like tell you you're rubbish. You're never going to be able to do it. They're there to just help you, build you up, and make you a better athlete. So like when a coach or when someone's criticizing your performance, 
it's not it's not in a negative light it, you you may think it is to yourself mm. but it's just there to be constructive to help you in the longer run which it's probably difficult as a younger kid to grasp that almost so that, that that's like testing it it's just you like you're like you've done it out of the love to start with and like you you had that dream and they gave you the platform to do it and I, I I speak to so many people and like you've achieved so much in the sport that it's not until that you think you're like oh I wish I could have done more I wish I could have done this it's not until you actually like take a step back and realize what you actually done that you reached the highest level exactly. you, you performed at the highest level you got the results and all that exactly. uh, which is it's, it's difficult to almost live in that moment of when you get that result being like wow I just accomplished something amazing in the sport like I feel like we focus on the bad performances more than the positive ones and but they both have the exact same effect like mm. if you look at a bad performance and take the positives from it or find the stuff that you need to work on that's great but if you don't enjoy the other performances then like the when you have the good results or the good ones then you're, you're just going to you're just in a cycle of you're just performing you're just there to perform you're not there to live in the moment and enjoy the wind when they come because as we've said before they can be so rare so you almost need to live in that moment and enjoy it but i feel like as athletes we're like right that competition's done we're done well right focus on right that's it done focus on the next one it's hmm. it, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle in the sport do, do you think you've almost like when you won your european bronze for example do you think you enjoyed the moment more like when you were there do you think looking back you're like i wish i celebrated that more or <laughs> mm. i don't really know i <sighs> obviously in 2017 in tenerife mm -hmm. at the junior under 21 world championships uh Norway got a silver medal um so Nora got a silver medal uh she got to the final and uh, was beaten by Japan but uh the first medal at a world championships for a long long time mm. a junior world championship and I felt like the joy that I had from that was a lot more than the joy I got from my own from my own achievements when like literally me and me and the the people on the team like the other boys on the team like we were walking around in tenerife like with our hands on our head we're like oh what's happened yeah. what's happened like what's happened this is <laughs> the, and they they had i i had never been to a like world championship before or anything so i didn't really know like how norway do or i i knew like in theory but then when it happened i was like oh my yeah. <laughs> and then i think i think other people reacted that way when i got my medal mm. um but i don't I was happy, but it's a difficult one to be honest, because it was um, before I went there, I went with like a kind of an expectation saying that I'm going to better the last one, got seventh place last year. I'm going to try to better that. And then when I was there and I knew like from after the first fight, I, I knew that this is, this is my day in some way. Like I don't know what way, but this is my day in some way. And then, when I got there and then um, obviously you told me before that when you, um, this was off camera, but you told me that when you talked to Emma, she had that, she told you that um, she couldn't tell you what she felt when she got that medal yeah. before that fight or not yeah. before that match. And it was the same way with me. Like when I think back at it, I can, I can relive a lot of the emotions that I've had before fights and stuff like this, but right there before that bronze medal it was just it was kind of i knew in a way that okay all right i've got this mm. i've got this I'm, i've not fought this guy before but i've got this and um it was uh, it was a very special moment and i was happy and i was i was celebrated and like we went out and ate good food and like literally but the day after it was it was over yeah it's like the you, understand? And it, you, yeah. you just come back to your normal life and um i think maybe i should have i should have appreciated it a bit more when it happened like it's uh it's my biggest achievement 
Yeah. Um, and if I'd known that at the time, then I would have, yeah. I would have probably maybe appreciated it more. But I was, I went, I, w- I wanted more, yeah. you know. And I get, when you get that feeling, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of, a lot of very famous like superstars, when they go out of that like out of that world, yeah. they end up doing other stuff. Like we have this guy in Norway that's, he's a world champion, Olympic champion skier. Mm-hmm. Like literally one of the greatest of all time, and um, after he like he finished and he retired, he'd get into so much trouble like cocaine, driving, like uh, speeding, uh, just just to get the thrill of that. And at that like that day, in two thousand eighteen, I got that thrill of that I want more of this. And then you get down, and then it's just. Like, I don't know how a high is, but it's probably like the same way. Like you do something, you do like yeah. drugs or whatever, and then you'd that come down and then you get the calm down. And you're like, okay, I'm going to chase this. I'm going to chase this. And then I never got that feeling again. Yeah. But obviously I didn't get that much success that I remember that feeling. Now I can't really remember how that feeling was. Yeah. But um, it's kind of the same way. Like a lot of people maybe, they struggle after they've finished their careers if they've had a very successful one that they struggle with oh where's that feeling where's that feeling obviously i only had that feeling like like properly once so i don't really know how it is but yeah. do you understand what i mean do, do, do you almost think as you say like you went unexpected you almost think you're like right that's the job done almost you're like because you'd built up the notion of i'm going to med i'm like because you put in the hard work and all that do you almost think right i've got the job done now that was like what you done mm. almost like yeah i think I, I i think i think so in a way like the the year before in sofia my first european championship um i was very close to a medal as well mm-hmm. but that was something i would never expect yeah. so if i'd medaled if i'd medaled there i think i would have been like on top of the world like literally on top of the world i didn't expect it at all like i got into repercharge charge and i was fighting and i i was fighting italy and i was being italy and then some things happened like mentally and I saw him getting tired and I thought to myself, Oh yeah, I should be tired as well. Cause Italy is tired. Yeah. And I just, I just messed it up in the last few seconds and the guy went on to the bronze final. And, um, but if, if that had been me and I'd gone one bronze, because I knew that that day actually was that good that I could have gotten a bronze medal, but it's just, I just messed up in some way. But if I'd gotten that bronze medal that day, I think that that would have been like, I would have been on top of the world. But mm. as you say, when you expect something, kind of, because I couldn't I couldn't expect that from the first fight and be like, oh, I can't, I'm going to go and win a medal today. It needed to build up. But then when I got to the uh, the bronze medal match, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah I've got, I've got this. Yeah. I And um, yeah, so that definitely is like job done. We yeah. Move on to the next one. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that like you can't live that moment again. Yeah, definitely. Just how it is. Because like after that experience, like like the senior British title for me, like it was a title that I've always like chased. And I always knew I should have won it earlier, I should have won more. So like when it got to the final, like I enjoyed the final, I enjoyed the moment. But I was almost like, right, I've, I've done it now because I knew that I, thought, yeah. I knew I should have won it. I shouldn't like and then when I finally done it, I was like, okay, like that's it done. Like good. I can tick it off my list almost. And Mm. It's, it's a difficult thing to comprehend because I remember speaking to Paul Newby like years ago and all that. And he, when he won his title in 2004 at the Worlds, they were like full time athletes at the time. They were sponsored by like, the National Lottery. They were getting funded. And yeah, yeah. he expected going to win the world title, I think, in Madrid, like the Worlds, to, uh, like in 2002. He may not have got the result he wanted. And he knew that he should have had it. And like going in Mexico, like when he won his world title, he he was just standing on the podium, like, right, this is it. Job's done almost because he was given all the money, all the support, and he, he knew that he he knew that he, 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 he knew that he should win it. So like when he won it, it was like, right, okay, job's done. And it, did, and, and it didn't change his life, no, in a way. Yeah. Or it did, obviously it did change his life, Paul Newby world champion. Yeah. But like it was when he went back to work on Monday again or whenever the next week again, it was same thing all over again. 
yeah exactly and it was yeah. the, it was the same with me as well like when i got back from russia and i got back it was yeah i got back to normality it wasn't yeah nothing was yeah it's 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 probably one of those things because we don't have a season like we we talk about we've got a season and all that <laughs> but realistic we don't we go to paris at the beginning of january we can go to china in december and then we're just back we're at training camps throughout december and we're back in that cycle again so it's it's mm. not like say winning the premier league for example right you've got that euphoric moment at like the end of may and then you can celebrate with your teammates for the full summer and all that whereas we we celebrate a competition <laughs> And then we're back to work. We've got a competition the following weekend, and back and forth, back, back and forth. Yeah, it's like because we don't have that season to end on a high. Almost like you kind of just need to put it in the past yeah. and move on. Which it's That's a like difficult that. thing. Like looking back on now, it's it's not until we actually like for me like these lockdowns. Like I've been speaking to like, a few people, and, and we're like, wow, we've actually achieved so much in the sport that you don't actually comprehend until you take a step back and look you're like it's probably the same as you like you're but me, me me coming into this at the beginning when we're talking about like expectations and like what i what i haven't achieved and just like okay what i've done is what i've done i couldn't have done better and then afterwards when i start talking about what i've actually like gone through and what i've actually achieved then it's then you sit there and you're like oh wow okay yeah. it's actually something and the, and the thing not, is it's not something that every single person in life gets to, like, go through. Like, like my friends, your friends. Very, like, very few. Very yeah, few people. Like, we get to travel the world. We get to do something we love. We get to compete at the highest level, represent our country at world European championships. Like, seeing, seeing the world, making friends throughout the whole world. Like, not many people get those opportunities. And it's not that we take them for granted. We just don't appreciate them in the moment. Like... Say like right, we were in Madrid, like I like, playing the PlayStation or something like that. We, we're just having a good time, but it's not until we look back in the years, like after that, that you're like, like they're such good memories and all that that mm. you don't appreciate. It. It's the exact same being in the sport, like celebrating the wins, celebrating the losses. Like you don't. It's not until you look back and you're like, wow, I actually performed amazingly at that competition. Like it's difficult to have that self self reflection. And might enjoy mm. living in that moment. Yes, definitely. It's, 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 it's a weird one. By the way, do you see that? No. Oh, certificate. Sochi. Ah, oh, nice. Good, good, <laughs> good, little, good little detail in the background. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's a cool. One. I'm a, so I'm a, I don't, I don't recognise it because I don't have one. So. Oh. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"What's> <laughs> <that>? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was. Um, it's been a, um, it's been a career, man. It's been a mad career, and um, I don't know, like, if I hadn't been believed in from the start, then I have no idea what I would have done. Because obviously, for me, it was a lot easier being funded and. Yeah, we got great support from like Olympic Federation in Norway and like the Norwegian Martial Arts Federation and stuff like this, so everything was easy. Um, I didn't need to go out. I didn't need to go to uni at once. I didn't need to go and work. I didn't need to do anything like that. I just I could focus on, yeah, focus on my sport and focus on performance and learn. Like I could, I had time to learn stuff because I was very new into the game. I no, I no like no knowledge about strength and conditioning, no knowledge about nutrition, but I got all these resources given to me. Like I'd get a strength and conditioning program. I can, t I could, I could go and talk to like a sports nutritionist. Um, I could go talk to a like sports, like sports psychologist, a mental coach. And I had all of those things there, which made it that much easier for me, like as a new athlete to actually just step it up a level. Like I didn't need to go through that grind of, yeah, training and working to get to a competition and then trying to qualify for a, a European championship because that's all I wanted to do. And I'd use all my earn money and then I'd go back to work and stuff like this. Yeah. So obviously if I hadn't been believed in from the start and I wouldn't have gotten the resources that were given to me, I don't know if I would have achieved that or if I would have achieved any of what I'd achieved because things would have gone a lot slower. Yeah. 
and that's like something that you do like you'd you'd go and work like you told me you just got back from a night shift and you'd go yeah. and work and you'd work so many hours and you'd have to put away money savings yeah. to manage to go to a can you talk me through that how does that work like say for example you've you've planned out a season right yeah and you're in say, say we're in december mm -hmm. and you're going to go to 10 competitions in a year yeah how does it look like I don't want to know the numbers, no, no, but how does no, it look like? Yeah. How does it look like financially? Like, how so, do you plan it out? Yeah, so basically, for me, every single penny I earn goes back into the sport. Like, I okay. don't, I don't spend on anything else. Like, I do, pay, do you I, live? Do you live at home? Yeah, I live at home because if I didn't live at home, then I wouldn't be in a finance, like a financial position to be able to afford to go to competitions. It's as simple as that. Mm. So I've worked since I've worked in the same job since I was 16. So for like the last eight years, I've worked in the same job every single what, penny. What day. do you do? I, I worked as like I work as like a sales assistant in like a retail shop. So I've done that okay. and then I've taken on a second job like during lockdown, which is a full time position working for like a COVID testing company. So yeah, that like I do that as well. So that's like 40 hours a week and then I've got like a part time job on top of that. So like Every every bit of money that I earned just went straight back into like the sport. And then when I went to uni, like I got like off like my loan, my bursaries and all that. And people usually spend that on like like going out drinking, enjoying themselves and all that. Whereas again, I put all that money back into the sport. And I like, it, it gets difficult at times, like don't don't get me wrong. Like you kind of need to pick and choose, like like we say we've got 15, 20 competitions a year, but I need to be smart and being like, I can't afford to go to Dubai, Chile, Japan, like all of these ones, like physically. Because they're expensive. They're they're so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So like we almost kind of need to be like, right, what ones can we almost peak for, put in a great performance and take like the ranking points or take the performance from that one and then go to like little competitions throughout you to work on, like the, the wee small details that we almost <laughs> do. So like when we go to the big mm -hmm. ones, almost they like perform almost. So for me, like I, I've, all, I've always enjoyed like, like people always rip me for trying to find like the cheapest accommodation or like the cheapest travel or something like that. But people like people outside the sport, like how do you afford to go to all these countries? And I'm like, well, you, you, you just do it in a basic you find you find a way almost like people in the sport like oh you you do this you do that but i'm like well if i do this then it's going to make me afford to go to the next competition so mm. like it, it doesn't bother me and for me like, what, i just what's, what's the worst place you've stayed at oh, oh that's the See, quick fire man i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> one day one day i'm gonna be the host and we're gonna talk about you <laughs> See, that's the thing. Like, not many, not many people find out about my, my experiences. Uh, I don't think it was bad, but some people, would, some people, would everyone say, around you, some people would say the accommodation I found in Chile was bad, but the accommodation was absolutely fine for the money that we paid. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it was. Oh, where is it? The, the, the highest big, the, I, I never booked these places. <laughs> Uh, I I think Prague was was pretty awful. Like there, yeah, there was like, there was like four of us in a room with one double bed and a single bed. So like mm, yeah, yeah yeah I can, I can imagine. Chill, like, just yeah the whole the whole surroundings of it weren't the best. But I never booked that. It's only, it's only been the last couple <laughs> of years that I've booked trips. I've been uh, responsible enough, but at the same time. People, people want to get away. People want to, right? We, we, we almost need to find a way. Like we can't stay in luxury accom. Like people want no, to stay no. in luxury and, accommodation. And don't don't get me wrong. Like I was a full time athlete, but we didn't we didn't fly first class, and we never. Exactly. No. So I was I was um I was at a training camp in uh, in Germany once, and uh, you know how Germany have like they've got like so many places that are so far away from civilization. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's crazy isn't it it's like there's no like city or anything and it was this what was this place called wald mickelback was the place and it's like in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the forest and me and wayne uh we get to the hotel 
<laughs> and um, there's a guy in the reception and he, and he says, yeah, uh, here are some water bottles. You can take them when you want to take them. And here are your rooms. And we go into the rooms and there's this tiny, obviously me and Wayne never share the same room. So I had my room and he had his room. There's this tiny bed, like this thin mattress. And I went into the bathroom and uh, the shower wasn't even like connected as on the shower. It was just like taped around. And I opened my window and I only saw like forests. And then I tried to pick up my phone to send a message to Wayne and say like, oh, this is the worst room ever. Look at my phone, there's no service. And for, for the four days that we were staying there, there was no obviously no breakfast. We never saw anyone else. Like the reception was empty and dark. So I don't know if we had the hotel by ourselves or whatever, but no idea. See, that's the thing. You you, you do, you sign up for some competitions, especially in Europe, <laughs> and you just end up in the most crazy of places. Like, we signed up for the Venice Cup, obviously. You're like, oh, Venice Cup, go to be in Venice. <laughs> Two hours outside of Venice in Crowley is like a ghost town. Like, you go. Oh, and- really? Is it? Is it outside of Venice? Two hours. Two hours outside <laughs> of Venice. Like we we one year we got we finished the other competition. We got a bus into Venice. Like it's a two hour bus only. We spent three hours in Venice and got another two hour bus back. But the thing, like it was literally a ghost town. Like obviously it's probably a booming summer was up, but we went in like October or something like that. Mm. No way around. I think there was like one pizza shop open, and we just had pizza every single night. Every, every that's, that's, that's what you do as an athlete, don't you? You only eat pizza. You, well, that, that's what we used to do. We'd only go to Italians just because it's it's safe. Like yeah, Italian that, restaurants, yeah. it's safe as well. You need to get your carbs <laughs> in them, of course. Obviously, we, we've, <laughs> got, we've got, shall we say, fussy people. But on our team, like, we've got people who are, like, vegan or, like... Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they don't eat this. Uh, with you know, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know who they are. And we've also got someone who's uh, like got a gluten intolerance as well. So that's just another thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It's not ideal, but y- you make it work. But yeah, like... Yeah, but it's so, like, looking back at it, like, there's like some of the best memories that you've made is, like, literally sleeping in a... When you're in a training camp, you sleep in, like, a... In, like, a hall with, like, 20 other countries and yeah. you just... You're sleeping on your own, like on your inflatable mattress, and that doesn't even it doesn't even have air in it when you wake up in the morning. But it's just it's just the the vibes in it. Yeah, because as I don't know if you were there, but I remember uh, some of the guys from our team went over to Denmark for a training camp. Yeah, I was there. I I, yeah. I trained. In, I think was it 2015. I think. Yeah. Yeah, 2015. I trained with I trained with uh, Johnny and Dylan when yeah. they went over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like they they were like sleeping in the dojo the full time. Yeah, but like, you you, you that's, don't that's, that that's so cool, man. You, you you make memories and all that out of it. Like you you may at the time be like, oh, fuck, why why am I sleeping on the floor <laughs> of this dojo for however long? But looking back, like that was actually a fun experience. Like, yeah. and everyone else was doing it as well. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. It's, not like you're, it's not like you're missing out. But you see, for me, like I'd much rather spend as little money as possible on accommodation because realistically you're not going to be staying there you're going to be no, you're, you're, saying, you're going to be at the competition for what four days or something like that you are you're going to be out sightseeing around the city the country that you may never get to travel to again and then you're just going back to sleep so like i, I don't need fancy accommodation i'd much rather pay that accommodation and be able to afford on all two trips or something like that. That's the way like my thought process works anyway. But that's because yeah. I enjoy traveling and I don't mind like yeah, less what, comedy. What what about the layovers? Like if, uh, if you'd book a if you'd book a plane ticket, like what's the worst thing? What's the what's the longest layover that you've had? Oh can you remember that? I I'd probably say I don't know if it was the longest. Oh well, I say this. I made I made a twelve uh I, I didn't say I, I made it, uh, but we, me and Dylan had a 24 hour layover before going to Chile. <laughs> but the, Not the, really. Yeah, but the thing is, like, it was a layover in Barcelona. So, like, I was like, right, we'll just book a, like, there was some flights, like, throughout the next day, but the price difference wasn't that much. So I was like, Dylan, right, why don't we just 
take the flight the next day, book quite a cheap accommodation close to the airport and just go out exploring in Barcelona for 24 hours. So we just yeah. booked and then went about Barcelona for 24 hours, which was great. Like, we had a great time. But probably the... Uh, and I'd done the same for Shanghai, going to Shanghai as well. Like, I'd, yeah, when you went to the Great, great World China. China. Yeah. So jealous. Yeah. So like, jealous. A tw- like a 12 hour lay over there. But again, that, that was because I, I planned that. But probably the worst tra- like, travel one was going to Chile. Because mm. like the first time that we went, because we went from Glasgow to New York, New York to Texas, then Texas down to Santiago. So it was like worked out like 34 hours of flying time. Oh. And it was, yeah, it was. It was just awful. You know, when we went to uh, when we went to Tokyo in mm. 2019, I think, yeah, 2019 end, end of, it was, you know, when we when we were sitting in the hotel room on the Sunday evening, I think, there was a typhoon. <laughs> Literally a typhoon, like a natural, like a natural disaster. It was like, and we would look out of the window and it was raining and we'd see like roofs flying and pla- like, like like trees everywhere. And we had no idea if we'd, if we'd get to the airport or not. And um, we had like, we had booked transport for like 6 a.m. Huh. And the guy came, like an Uber driver came or whatever. I don't know if they have Uber, but whatever. Like, um, and took us to the airport. We're at the airport at like 8 a.m. and there's no people there. Literally no people. You was all dedicated. And- yeah, no, but I think I think the taxi drive was a bit crazy. I was sleeping on the way, so I had no idea. But we got to the airport at 8 a.m. or whatever, and um, we talked to the people in the check-in. They're like, yeah, there might be some delays on their flights. And they're like, oh, okay, all right, it doesn't matter. We're used to delays. And we go through security check-in, no people at the airport. And uh, they're on the speaker, they're like, oh, there's a typhoon in, in Tokyo. We might not be able to fly. And we're like, oh, okay, all right, maybe a couple of hours. We're used to this. Yeah. And then um, I'm looking through my Instagram and everyone who's in Tokyo, they're like, oh yeah, we've spent six hours to get a taxi from the hotel to the airport. The taxi's stopped. It doesn't have more diesel. There's this and this and this and this. And when when our plane's supposed to leave at 11 a.m., it doesn't leave. And they're like, yeah, new time, new time, 5 p.m. Here's some food vouchers. And we get food vouchers. We could spend them or whatever. We yeah. got food. 5 p.m. comes, no plane, new food vouchers. And we were literally in the airport for 26 hours in Tokyo. And that's not a layover. That's like the first part of our trip. And um, <laughs> 1 p.m. the next day, so 26 hours later, our plane left. So for 26 hours, I was at Tokyo airport walking around the people at Starbucks saw me when they came for work, when they went back home, and then when they came back to work again. But it was uh, yeah, crazy. And it took us took us 50 hours from Tokyo to Oslo. 50 <laughs> hours. Like the trip was already like 20 hours, but it took us 50 hours. I'm like, I, I enjoy a wee layover. So I, I'll, take, I'll take a trip off my for layovers, but 50 hours, man. I'm like... <laughs> we, well, you not did they not let you as like like just go back out of the airport? Or no, no, no that was that was dangerous. I was going to say, did you just not want to as well? No, but they like when you go through security, they're not yeah. going to let you out. Yeah, I think they're they're kind of strict on that. But yeah, we were we we didn't really want to go either because it was chaos. Oh, yeah, chaos. <laughs> but, Bloody <laughs> man. I I think like me and Dylan on the way back from Chile, we we literally went. We went past Scotland, went back across Scotland, and then went back <laughs> again. Just for the cheapest way, because I think we went, we landed in what, Madrid? Then we went Madrid into Germany, Germany into London, London back into Glasgow. <laughs> so, oh, oh. yeah. And like, like you're, you're probably the exact same. Like, coming back for a competition, you're like, I just want to get home. Oh, like, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Yeah. And 50 hours as well, when it took 50 hours. Oh, oh my. Oh, well, yeah, it's, a, it's an experience, and I, th- those are the things that you remember. Like, not there's, there's not a lot of people who can say, oh, I got stuck in a typhoon in Japan. Exactly, yeah, I got stuck in a typhoon. I forgot like, about the experience now. Yeah, I'm like, my, my Japan experience was pretty smooth compared to that, actually. Like, yeah. we actually 
the only sketchy part of when we were in Japan was we had to we were staying in Kofu Yamanashi, which is like two or three hour train journey outside of Japan. And like the, the people that Is were, that that uh, super train? Uh, it's not no but the, the faster trains and what you get in uh, school yeah, anyway, yeah. put it that way. <laughs> uh, but the people that we were like living like in like Kofu with, they were already in Tokyo and they were like, right, you just need three trains to get here. Uh, these are the times you need to get on get off and get on the trains and we're like are, are you joking like they don't speak any English whatsoever we need to get on <laughs> they, do this, they do this when it starts <laughs> you like, excuse on. me excuse me do you know the way to <laughs> and I'm like I can't even say yes or no we need to get off a train get on another train get off another train and get on another train and we're like me, me and Chris were there I'm like Chris's sense of direction or common sense. We'll, 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 say it's, we'll say it's not the best, but we'll put it that way. So like, I was the responsible adult at the time and I was sitting in the train with Chris and I was like, are we in the right train? Like, are we actually on the right... And this was like uh, 10, 15 minutes in, but we kind of just need to go with it now. You, you have no idea. You at least you have no idea. But the, got, the thing got, about them is that the Japanese, they, they really want to help you. It's just that they, they, they don't really know how to. And so it, they, this this is not rude from their side. It's just that they, they have don't, no idea what you're saying and they don't know how to communicate with you either. Yeah. And like because like we were in like the outskirts, not many people spoke English. So like we no, kind of no. just needed yeah. to gauge it almost. And then we, we, we got there safe, safely enough. Yeah. So that's so cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, that experience and a half. So like what what other moments like because obviously we've we've spoken about like people only see the results in our sport they don't see the peaks and the troughs the highs and the lows the roller coaster that we go on like what other moments in the sport would you say like looking back on now that you can be proud of that you've accomplished in the sport um... because you you've accomplished a lot but. I, the people that I, the people that I speak to, the, hearing it from someone else, they don't think that they have until someone else has said it, an outsider's perspective almost. Mm. And mm. it's not until someone else tells you that you actually realise, you're like, wow, well, actually, I actually did do a lot. It, um, may not, may not, it may not be to, you've gotten everything <clears throat> you want to achieve in the sport, but you've had success, which mm. you need to take and you need to take... Pr- Proud but never satisfied, right? Which is athletes. Uh, it's just good to have. It, it keeps that fire yeah. going in you. Definitely. Um, so we can start on the national level. Yeah. Um, so uh, every every national championship that I've fought, I've like in Kumite, I've got I've won, so I've become national champion. Since 2000, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, I broke my foot in Salzburg, so I couldn't fight. <laughs> but um, 2019, um, I also won like award for best male athlete at that Norwegian Championship, wow. and uh, with that, you get like a, you get like a silver trophy, which is actually real silver, uh, which has like the king's badge on it. And they call it the King's Trophy in Norway. So, say for example, if you do if you do tennis and you become Norwegian champion in tennis, and you're the best athlete at that Norwegian championship yeah. in tennis, you get one of those. So, <clears throat> I've got one of those at home. I actually, got got. It. Do you want to see it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm very intrigued right. now. Right. Just the way you've right. described it. It's quite cool. So it's a cup. And then, oh, so this is like the king's uh, badge. Yeah. And then around here it says the king's trophy in no- in Norwegian, and it's yeah, it's nice. a silver cup. And I actually need to take care of it. I need to like, yeah, there's real silver in it. Yeah. So I need to polish it. But um, that's yeah, so cool. that's that's the the coolest thing that I've won in Norway, yeah. and it's uh, yeah, that's one of the proudest and achievements. That, that's that's a really big achievement, like. <laughs> Like to win, like, like yeah, like it's it's recognized like in the whole of sporting Norway. This is recognized like 
if you say, oh, this guy's got a King's Trophy, he's like, okay, yeah, this guy's... He's, he's, he's up there. He's, he's up there. Yeah. So I, I got that off for my Norwegian title in 2019. Um, I became Nordic champion as a senior in 2018. Nice. Um, um, in Finland. Very proud of that as well. Um, and uh, obviously the one that's at the top is that European bronze medal, which... Um, so, which was so the that, first which was the first under 21 male european medal at, in the uh, under 21 category for in norwegian history see, see, so, the, um, see the thing is like that's even something to take away as well like like the record books like that like you you've almost like paved the way sort of thing like no matter who wins afterwards you were always the first person to do it which mm. is, a, is an achievement in itself like that you need to be proud of and the, and the thing is You've you've went from twenty fifteen, was it twenty fourteen you started back? Mm. Yeah. So you've had that amount of success from almost restarting from nothing, shall we say, like you had the foundations, but as a fighter, <clears throat> you almost like done that in such a small period of time, which in itself, like just reaching that level of going to a Europeans and a world championships is an amazing achievement, but been able to win the Nordics, like King's Trophy, European bronze, and that short time frame is is an amazing achievement in itself, which which should be proud of. Do you think that's almost down to obviously like growing up as a kid, you experience like bad habits, like it's like you kind of get shown bad habits, whereas where you're shown like the way everything should be done from the get go, almost because I can imagine Wayne's a very he wants it done in this specific way because he knows what works whereas as a kid I'm like shown a lot of different ways like and you kind of just progress and build on it whereas you are shown from like an elite level straight away do you think that was like almost like helped your success as well well definitely when you are older and um, you're more like you're more aware of things and you understand stuff a lot more like you don't really you just don't just go through the motions like i understood so obviously i karate for me is a sport it's like what i was an athlete in it's uh it's not really what's like in my blood if you understand like fighting it's not like it's not like something i did when i was really young and it just was natural for me all the way and then i'd build like bad habits along the way but i learned from very early on in my career with wayne that there's just some things that need to be how they are yeah. and I just need to perfect that like he's he, he has this thing that he says he says don't do something until you can't get it wrong no don't do something until you get it right do it so, until you can't get it wrong and we just drill and drill and drill and drill and that li- that helped me a lot with like um not developing bad habits yeah so like I, I would understand that, okay, I need to do this and this is how a punch is supposed to look like. And I'd get burpees if I do it wrong or I'd I'd get something and I'd, I'd hate that because it would yeah. be extra training on top of all that hard training I was already doing. He'd yeah. be like, yeah, you need to do 50 burpees at the end of the session. And I'd be like, no, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to perfect this. I'm going to perfect this, perfect this. And I would understand that. And that would, obviously, you pick up bad habits along the way. Like when you're so fresh into a sport and you see someone else doing something, yeah, that's something I would do as well. Like for example, like dropping my guards, mm. it's like one of the most stupid things in the world. But I see a lot of the best people do it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, sometimes I'd be like, oh, I'll do that as well. But then we'd go home from the competition on the Monday. Wayne would have me like holding weights around my around my hands, and I'd be just standing there for like two three minutes, and he'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, you're learning now. Now you're not gonna put your guard down. <laughs> Do you understand? So I'm kind of a person that I need to get like, I don't know if I need to get punished for doing something yeah. wrong to no. learn how to do it. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's yeah. good in that way. It's good. So yeah. definitely, definitely, I'm very thankful that I didn't have a lot of bad habits going into it. That I learned a lot of it from from the fresh. Yeah. So, no, definitely. And I, as we say, like having Wayne there to teach you, like no matter like so, some coaches they may they may just say oh yeah do it like this way because they think it's the right way whereas with Wayne 
he knows it's the right way. So yeah. like, whatever yeah. he tells you to do, you're like, right, I'm just going to listen to it because he's done that. He's experienced that as an athlete. He's done that as a coach. He knows what works. So it's like, exactly. ma- no matter what he tells you to do, you know that it's going to help you regardless. <laughs> if he tells you to go and do 50 burpees, he's like, that, that, that may be extra training for you, but that's going to be just extra conditioning as well. <laughs> like, so exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a there's a reason behind everything. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I'm so that's why I'm so thankful as well. Like, uh, when I used to um, when I started taking everything seriously, because in the beginning it was a bit difficult to like balance. I was going to do two sessions of karate a day, and then I was going to do my strength and conditioning like two or three times a week. It was very difficult to balance all of it, so I would like neglect some of the stuff. Yeah. So I would not do my strength and conditioning and I would I would reward myself with eating bad food when I've finished training because I'd be like, oh, I've been through so hard. And I had no idea like about like clean eating and um, energy and stuff like this. But when I got into it a bit and um, I got help, like, for example, uh, from Rory, like uh, late 2018, I started working with Rory Kavanagh, uh, RK Smart on Instagram, uh, yeah. strength and conditioning coach and athlete from Ireland. Uh, started working with him and he'd send me programs and that just took my game to a new level um, because a lot of it is karate but a lot of it is also what you do in the gym and uh, you know this you're 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 strong aren't you yeah because you're short because you're because you're short yeah short, short limbs short yeah that's it yeah no but because uh, you know the importance of it as well and that's yeah everything is so important like when you're in a professional sports professional environment as you as we've said so many times, like we're at the, we compete at the highest level in the sports where everyone has got their nutrition on point. Everyone's done doing this. Everyone's doing this. And a person that I see, actually, I want to give a shout out who does this, who's gotten into a lot of like, um, and has elevated his game because of this is Greg. Yes. Greg from, um, from your team, Greg Anderson. Like I see he's got, um, he's got like a sponsorship with like a meal prep people and he does his strength and conditioning and he's a very good fighter, I think. And I think like things like that, that's what's going to help you to develop even more outside of just the training that you're doing. So yeah, Greg, if you're listening, shout out to you. Yeah. No, it's, it's a really good point because everyone's going to be, they're going to be strong. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Like, Everyone knows how to do all that, but it's like the small marginal gains that some people may not be willing to put in the time and the effort. They just think it's not worthwhile, but they're actually going to have the biggest impact on your performance. Because I like, obviously I am like I've the same as you. Like, I've I've done a sports science degree, so like I know the importance of like the specific science behind stuff, and that's that's helped me like adapt my performance. I feel like in this sport, like certain nations do it, and that's how they're so successful. But I feel like going down like the scientific route and like seeing like how mechanically the body works is going to have like, a greater impact on like the athletes. And, all that. and it's something that Roy does well because obviously like his background as well. And that's because I feel like a lot of athletes they don't really have a specific program for karate. They're doing like a generalized program of Olympic lifting, compound movements, and all that, but they don't actually know how it's specific to what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So, like, you need to you, you need to look at like every single. So, say you're doing this. Why is this good for karate? And why would why would you do step ups like explosive step ups? Are oh, you would do it because that would help with the drive of this? And Rory was very good at this. And yeah. hopefully, like when I finish my degree as well, I could help to some extent like help other athletes as well like developing that because i'm learning all about this now like biomechanics and uh just like training like principles of training like uh about load about all of this and there's a lot of people like when i started out as well um i was given like a general program which i followed for like a year or on and off and then after that i thought like oh this is old now i need to find something on google so i started doing like a I started doing like a five times five program, like the strong lift thing. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was getting stronger, but it wasn't really helping. It wasn't really translating. So that's very important as well. Like scientifically, I think karate is, is quite far behind the other sports when it comes to like how you scientifically yeah. go about. Cause that's what, that's what matters. Yeah. That's, that's what matters actually. Like that's science 
what has been proven to help, what has not been proven to help. Yeah. That's what's going to help you, I think, in the long run. If Karate stays Olympic, I don't think it's going to stay Olympic at all. I don't think it's going to come back on the Olympic program. But uh, if it does, or yeah. as Karate is going to develop, yeah, oh, we're going to see a lot more. Yeah. We're going to yeah. see a lot more of like... Because obviously, you're probably, you're probably <laughs> the same as me. I, I've Most of the research I've done at uni was around karate because it's what what I'm passionate about, it's what I love. So like when I was delving into all the research, like right, there's only a select few nations, like uh Serbia does it well and Brazil does it well. But other nations outside of that, they don't really use like a scientific approach to like the sport or they don't they don't do like a lot of testing on it. So it's such a like widely under like utilized or research sport. Like in terms of what we're doing, because see my dissertation at university, like the my findings and like at the end of my results of like my testing phase, like like all my lectures, like you need to get that published because like it'll revolutionise the sport. Like it's such a such a thing that athletes may not realise, like subconsciously that they're doing. Like mine was like anaver- analysing the acceleration rate of the yakuzuki uh throughout like subsequent rounds in karate so i got them on like uh you know like a resistance machine almost where it was like a hand cranked one but obviously mm. set to their body weight and it was set to how long you actually throw a technique for in a match so say we are working for three minutes in a fight you're actually only working for 19.3 seconds that whole fight so it's like you're moving, you're resetting the rest of the fight. So you actually only need to be able to perform for that set amount of time. So I, I'd done that for the 19 seconds and then we tested the Yakazuki, the acceleration rate, and the acceleration actually decreased uh, every single round, which is what you'd expect in karate, but people don't people don't actually, it's not until you, you see it that you're like, oh, I'm actually doing that. So like the research I found, it was... It got it got less and less, so like I could be able to pinpoint what rounds people needed to improve on and all that, and like it's simple things like that that can almost mm. help athletes like get to that next level. They're like they pinpoint the areas that they need to work on, they work on it. So like when they get to a world or a Europeans, then they're not going to decrease. Like they're going to keep that acceleration high, which is what which is what they're going to need to like win a fight. Almost, and but, that's what that's that's what I think as well. Like, if there's athletes that are coming up that looking for something, like you should contact somebody who's maybe done a sports science degree, who's like specialized in strength and conditioning, that has also done karate. So, like for example, my recommendation, uh, Rory Kavanagh, RK Smart, he's actually he's actually got like he's kind of his own company where like you can actually go- get in contact with him like some people can contact me as well if they want to it's just that i don't have anything set up that i can help people with at the moment but like for example with him you could actually message him and he'd get you a program and he'd fix that for you and stuff yeah. like that and it's definitely worth it it's yeah. definitely worth it yeah because going back on like that show specific science like i analyzed like my performance from a kata aspect because i feel like you can give a karate specific program, but a, a fighting one and a cat one that's going to be completely different. You're going to Definitely. need to work on like lighter loads uh, and keeping that resistance sharp because like there's no point you lifting heavy weights because in a fight you're you are you are not you need to keep under weight as well. Well, maybe not you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, there's most no people point doing a lot of compound movements because you're going to be adding on muscle mass but it's going to have a negative effect because you're going to need to diet more as well so you're better working at like a lower resistance but like shorter sharper rep ranges and like that's what i try to like work out for kata as well where I was... there's a lot of there's a lot of isometric strength like just yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so like, i i've done that i was like i was actually like, the movements of like my hands on my feet i'm like how do you actually move in kata? And I try to replicate that as much as possible in the gym. So it was like the same movements in a gym setup that are doing the exact same in the actual kata. And my app mm. took that into, I made like a six-month training program 
for the lead up to like the senior British that I ended up winning. So I was like, that was a competition that I focused on, I, like peaked for, periodized for, and all that, and it worked. So it's one of those things where science it, it, it actually helps and like these bespoke yeah. things like that actually work. So if you take the time to step back, actually analyze your performance, what you actually need, or just contact someone because there's, there's people around because it's an underutilized thing like sports science and karate. People think that not many people know that much about it, but mm. you know, actually there's, there's resources around that. You just need to just need to ask. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a very interesting subject that, yeah. Definitely. I, yeah. So obviously, uh, what obviously you've been part of like the Olympic cycle in Norway. What's like a tr- what was like your training setup? Like talk us like a week of like training in Norway. So obviously it's probably going to be different from like a funded athlete to me, like mm. still funded, like what you do. So like obviously like, take us through like the stuff that's involved in it. So um we'd have we'd have two places where we train. We train at um the Federation had their own dojo. Um mm which we would share with Taekwondo, who are doing exactly the same thing as us, going to the Olympics. Um, so um, we'd be in there. Um, most weeks would be in there like twice a day. Um, not just doing karate, but like doing, we do maybe, we do one like resistance session, which is based on karate, where we'd uh, use like resistant bands, Vertimax, uh, like uh, stuff like that. Um, where we do karate specific techniques um, just to like to build that strength and that uh, speed in the techniques and then we do um, we do um, also like circuits and uh, like agility training plyometrics and stuff like that there as well Um, but most of our work in that place would be karate technical we do maybe we'd spar maybe one so one or two nights a week where we'd maybe have more athletes come in um and then we do two or three times in the week uh, week we'd go to the gym which is at the olympic center in oslo um so we'd have a gym there where we had free access to where we would go and train and um we'd also do like off season we'd do saturdays we'd go we'd go to um there's like a big ski jump in norway uh, which have um, which have these stairs that we would uh, do stair runs at, which is absolutely terrible. But um, oh, God. <laughs> it's it's a it's a good feeling when you're finished. At least I can imagine. Finished, but yeah. So that would be like we do like two sessions Monday, uh, two sessions Tuesday. We do two sessions Wednesday, two sessions Thursday, maybe one session Friday, and one session Saturday. So do about like twelve. 10 to 12 sessions a week, about 24, 22 hours of training. Um, and yeah, that would be our normal. So we'd go, we'd start in the morning, we'd do like a 10.30 or 11 a.m. session until 1 a.m., no, 1 p.m. Okay. And then we'd do uh, 1, <laughs> 1 p.m. And then we'd do, we'd do like 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. in the evenings. So um, it's good. Yeah. It's good. It's a good split. Do you think almost being in that environment of surrounding yourself with all those like, athletes like that that helped in your success as well like because obviously definitely. yeah definitely because yeah, yeah. i feel like over especially over the last few years norway has like they can go to a, a a competition and they can expect to pick up a couple of medals now that they've got like good quality especially in the heavyweights like they go to like worlds and europeans and like you expect you expect them to be in the later rounds medal matches and all that and that I think that's testament to being surrounded in that environment and like being able to push each other definitely but also definitely that and there's sometimes where you're not motivated to train mm. but you need to do it so everyone's everyone goes through that but when you get to that dojo and then Wayne is there and he's playing his music and he's like yeah yeah we're gonna go today then it just there's a switch that goes into your head and then you've got a lot of people around you that will do this that will do the same training as you that are maybe motivated the day that you're not motivated that just makes you push yourself extra um so it's yeah definitely like juniors cadets and under 21s like we've we've started seeing a lot of success in the past couple of years uh those are the like whether we've actually 
succeeded the most, but also seniors, like senior Europeans, 2019 Guadalajara, we had two bronze bronze medal matches um, and I got seventh as well and the girls team got seventh. So we're there, like we're, we're there and seniors as well. I'm 100% sure like the team that's going to the Olympic qualification, I don't really know if it's if it's ready yet, the team, but the people are traveling around the world at the moment, like training during these circumstances. Um, so Wayne, Bettina, Andrin, Lotta, Adrian, uh, who are actually trying, like they're, they're doing their best just to like to get to that qualification, maybe qualify. I've got I've got faith in them. Like it's it's many years in the in like it's many years in the making. Like those all those years that I was there and now that I haven't been there for maybe like nearly a year, they've continued progressing and the work that they're doing. I'm 100 percent sure that if I'd been in that situation, like I would also be ready like to go and qualify. But um, yeah. yeah, and 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 that's that's just like testament to down down to you is just pushing each other as you say. Like definitely, like you can have like one successful person who within the club, but you have like in the team, but you have all like read the success. We've all done, we've all done our our yeah. part here and there, and exactly. maybe not all together, but like every time there's something that we can take from each other. Do you almost feel like, obviously, like the the one that stands out for me is, uh, like the Youth Olympic gold. Did you think like that, like spurred something within the team as well? like definitely like, like when you succeed like it just push it just pushed you more as well definitely because youth olympics is it's kind of like the same uh format as what the olympics is going to be yeah. so w- when you get there there's that big chance of you actually getting to do something like that is you just need to have your day and annika was was there that time and we watched her like from home and it was amazing to see like someone from Norway can go to a place like that and actually win and become Olympic champion. And you can hear the Norwegian national anthem as well. It's, it was so motivating. It was like so motivating at the mo- at, at that time. And I'm hundred percent sure that when we, when the other people are looking back and they're going to go through their qualification day. And if they qualify, they can look back and be like, Oh yeah, Annika did it in the youth Olympics. Yeah, why and can't why can't I? Why can't I do that at the normal Olympics where there's only ten people as well? It's it's what we've spoken about like a lot. You just need that one day for everyone to yeah, click. Like, definitely, everyone definitely. can have it. If you have that one day, then there's no reason why that can't be your day, and everything just exactly. falls into place. And the, and the thing is with the qualifiers as well, you've got the top five people in each category taken out of the equation, so it just opens up the field even more. And if They've been consistently there and thereabouts in the medal matches, the later rounds. Then, I like, they can have. Yeah, I'm, 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 and, I'm confident. Yeah, I'm confident. Norway is gonna qualify at least one person. Amazing, nah, amazing. Mm. So obviously, you're part of like the setup and all that. How do you balance the travel? How did you balance the travel with all the training as well? Because it was structured. It's not like. Like you come back and you can have like a couple of days off. You like came back and you had to go into your job again. Like, how did you balance that aspect of it? It's um, it's a difficult one when it comes to training. Um, obviously you need your rest and after a travel, if it's a long travel, you need at least a day off just to like get back to. But um, it's, it was a bit difficult because our program was more. It's like it. It was more like of a test run in the beginning because we didn't nobody really knew what we we're doing and um we'd put up like our strength and conditioning in on days where we would travel or come back so those would fall out like we would not do those days a lot of times so it was difficult to balance at first but then afterwards we got like kind of got the hang of it so obviously you need to rest where you need to rest but we kind of kind of got into that when you get back on a Monday, you yeah. take Monday evening off and then Tuesday, maybe you do a light session, but then you're on it again, Tuesday evening, and then you go for the whole week. And then you just, the days you'd miss are the days that you'd miss, but everybody else misses those days as well. But um, obviously when you're not, when you're not working or you're not doing anything else, only thing you need to think about is your sleep and recovery yeah. and, um, and the rest takes care of itself. So um, yeah, there was a, it was a bit difficult in the beginning. Yeah. But then when you get into that and you've been actually at it for like three, four years where you've done the same thing over and over again, then you know it's just because kind of like what to do. Yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's right. One thing I actually want to touch on, 
like obviously we've spoken about like all your training and all that, but like take us back to like the actual like Europeans in Sochi. Like did, would you say like, everything on the lead up to that was like in place? Did it fall into place? Or like take us through like the competition, like and what you were feeling like round upon round, because obviously like, it's something that not many people get to experience, like hearing that insight and maybe something that you've done can like click with someone else or like, or if it is as we say it's just a process like you went through a process to get there almost mm. well work and like training and everything beforehand was the same as not leading up to any major championship like in the in the weeks leading up you'd do a lot of intense training and we do a pre-training for a week where we'd all die and then we'd <laughs> We'd like we'd rest a bit and then we'd do some when we'd get to Sochi we'd do like um, we'd do like shorter trainings more intense uh, but like ten seconds fifteen seconds one technique two techniques stuff like this um, but then the thing about it that was the thing about it which was quite special was that the year before it was kind of nearly exactly the same circumstances that happened like leading up to the day when I was fighting because as a heavyweight. And the last male category, mm. I was the last category like yeah. of the whole competition. So when I was warming up, the people before me, they'd leave, they'd leave. And I was, me and a couple of other people were the only people left in the warm-up area. And Wayne, and I'd seen everyone else from Norway go through and we didn't really have any other results than than what what I could do next, right? Um, so I was with Wayne at the, in the warm up area, and he was like, "Yeah, you're the last one. Everything relies on you, kind of." <laughs> and um, and it actually that that pushed me a lot because I thought like, "Yeah, yeah, why why can't I be the one that's the hero for the day?" If you understand what I mean? Yeah, no, because um, some people might they might have the opposite effect, and they might crumble under the pressure. Like, well, my everything resting on my shoulders, but you flipped down mm-hmm. a positive, which. It, mm. it paid off and um but the competition was like it was it started off it didn't really start off really well like i'd uh, i fought a guy from georgia which was i'd never seen or heard of before and obviously georgia as a country with heavyweights are yeah. quite yeah. respectable he had uh, gogita in his corner which i respect a lot i've fought him before and i think he's a very good fighter and it just made that like the first round is always the one that you're like, oh, if I can get through this, I can get through the next one. I just need to get started. And um, I started quite badly, to be honest. I was 2-0 down, but then I thought to myself, you know what, I just need to tr- trust what I've been doing in training and just need to uh, just need to keep going. And a fight's never over before it's over. Like before that, say, that, that um, you know you know how that sport data, that... Um, that what sound that makes it makes like a some sound like that when it's zero seconds left so i was just i was going and picking up my points and um it was two two going into the, like the last 10 seconds i got him out of the tatami and i knew to myself like if i can just finish this strong i'm going to win this on the referee's decision um and then i hit them and then two three seconds left i hit him with this my gary and I get all these emotions and I turn around to the Norwegian crowds and I go like, Whoa. <laughs> I go crazy. And everybody like, they're like, yeah. And I'll get that referee decision. And that really helped me with my, like, with my confidence going, going through. So you just talk um, quickly. Do you think, obviously you said the Europeans before that, you got caught in the last 10 seconds. Do you think having that happen to you, where that person obviously didn't give up, like no matter what time is left, drink that like has a subconscious effect on your performance from the next one being like he, he, he never gave up so why can't i was, not give up the it was in the back of my mind and i was in kind of the same situation as he was in like two nil down i didn't get those lo- those points in the last seconds i worked myself up to get a two one to two two and yeah. then i got him out of the tatami but it was just that i had it in the back of my mind i was like i've I've lost the fight where I've been 2 0 up. Why can't he lose a fight when he's 2 0 up? So I just go after him or after him. And that those emotions that like I wish, like the thing about this competition is that I haven't got anything on camera. The only thing I've got on camera is like my bronze, bronze medal match, which is which is a good fight. But I like I wish I could see like the raw emotion and everything of which was around 
So. Because there was like so much, I felt like there was so much pressure on me from myself as well to perform there. And I was like, I can't, I can't lose first round because I knew if I, if I win first round, I can win the second round. And then I had, I had, um, and then I fought Israel, Israel in the, by the way, not to be political, but I, I don't understand why Israel are in the European Championships. Anyways, uh, it's an, uh, they're in Asia. Anyways, uh, for Israel, and then I, I won like 10-1 or something like this. And that just boosted my confidence more as well. And I was on f fire that day, felt so well. And then I got into the semifinals and I fought Belarus. Um, and I lost, yeah. but I put up a great fight and I scored some techniques that I never thought that I would score. And then it was just about that reset and what we talked about earlier. Like I couldn't tell you what I felt between that and and the bronze medal match. And I saw the guy who went through the bronze medal matches. Like it was I fought Hungary and he'd literally gone on and just beat like the world bronze medalist from Spain before that. And I, that's the guy I was expecting to face. But then I faced Hungary instead. Um, but then it was just it was just about what you said. It was that trusting the process and knowing that if I hit that person with that one, two that I've been hitting people with the whole day, I am a hundred percent sure that I'm going to win this fight. And that's exactly what I did. I hit him with that one and that one, two, like four times. And I ended up winning four, two. And um, yeah. And, and, and then like the joy it's, and it wasn't, it wasn't just the joy like that I had, but like the, the joy to see like Wayne had been through he'd been through so much with me like so many times that we've just left competitions and he'd be angry at me I'd be angry at myself and we'd we'd go back and like what we're going to change what we're going to do and he was patient with me throughout this whole thing because you need to remember that it was like a, a year and a half with not a single result before yeah. I got that result and there's a lot of maybe a lot of coaches that would have stopped believing but he believed in me like the whole way and then the joy in his face when I when I when I got that when we finished bowing and everything and it was it was it was priceless it was like it's something that like i wish everyone can can yeah. experience yeah which is, which is probably why it's such an incredible film because not very many people get to experience it so mm. as it's going back to the thing we spoke about earlier like you need to save all that moment because it, it, it's such a rarity in sport where like you, you can, because obviously it's a like Europeans and worlds. Like they only come out once every two years. So, and having a performance where everything just clicks into place, it's it's difficult. But you have done it and you achieved it, which which is the main thing. Yeah, nah, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And it, it's one of those things where, like, in like a medal match like that, you almost just need to trust in your ability. It's like you need to kind of go into autopilot almost and not second guess yourself because if you do that, that's where you're going to lose those vital seconds where you can either score on someone or get scored on. So if you've got like a clear mind and you're able to like just do what you know you can do, then that's where you're mm. going to get the most results, which mm. is what you've done. Yeah. Not amazing. <laughs> oh, hey, is there, is there any like stuff we'll, we'll take the results side out of it like, is there any like memories within the sport looking back on now that you're like oh i'm, I'm so glad i done that or right like, it's just like fond memories that you look back on and it, and it just makes you smile i can see like your brain ticking over you like, <laughs> so many, but you get put on the spot like, oh, no. <laughs> it's a lot it's a it's a lot man like every single i've taken something away from every single experience that i've i've I've, I've had like every single trip that I've been on like it's the small things like we talked about earlier like in Madrid um, like just stay just in the hotel room playing PlayStation just having just having fun with uh, with friends and like meeting new people like, I remember in Madrid I got to know a lot of the Americans which I'd never known before um, and also just like all the exp the thing about it is that you're not going to remember every peop every person you've fought. You're not going to remember every stadium you've been to, but you're going to remember those like those small things. Like, say, for example, I've been to Tokyo. I've seen the world's largest pedestrian crossing. I've seen. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Like, I've se I've seen yeah. this. I've been to Shanghai. I've seen temples. I've been to Hong Kong. I've been to so many places. I've been to Dubai. I've seen the world's tallest building. Whatever. Um, 
And those are the things that I'm going to remember and that I've shared those moments with people that if I hadn't done this, I would have never known. Like we would have never have sat here if I'd never exactly. gotten that. Exactly. Do you understand? If if Absolutely. if they had never put that trust in me and said, oh, we want you as a full-time athlete, I would have never have known you. I would have never have known a lot of my, like my best friends inside the sport that I like still keep in contact with. So it's a beautiful sport, man. It takes you all over the world. You get to know so many people. Like if I ever go anywhere, like I know that I've got people that I can call yeah. like if i go to france if i go to scotland if i go to anyway if i go to hong kong i can call someone and I, I've, I've got a place to stay i've got a place to train i've got a place to go uh, some people can take me around so it's just it's just everything it just all adds up and um i wouldn't change it for anything man like yeah. all the bad experiences i've had all the losses all of that i wouldn't change anything for it, like anything yeah I, I, absolutely right. as we've said that is a roller coaster but and it's a fun one that's that's what makes exactly. roller coasters fun that's exactly. why you would go, you would go on one because you go down and go up you'd go down it's just all the emotions I, 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 if, if you kept on winning or you just kept on doing the same thing over and over again it'll become monotonous it'll become boring by mm -hmm. having that where you achieve those lows and you feel bad it just makes the highs and when you do achieve a something lot, so a lot better a lot yeah. better yeah and what, what were we touching on there? Uh, Experiences? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the thing as well. When, like, in 10 years' time, no one, as you say, like, no one's going to care mm. who you fought, who, what point you scored there, that, like, like what you done at that competition. What they're going to care about is the experiences you had, how they, how they made you feel, and, like, what you done, Right, and the lead up to all those competitions or what you've done afterwards, like that, that's when it's like when you close one chapter, like that's the stuff that you're going to carry over into like your, your next chapter in life, which is something as athletes, like it is difficult to like live in that moment, which was what we've spoken about and enjoy those moments because it's not like your career can be short, your career can be long, so you, you need to. You need to just live in those moments and, and enjoy them while still there because like that is what makes the sport so so great. Like you're right, like the results they're great, but everything else and the lead up to it is, is what makes the person that you are and what makes your experiences within the sport like so great. Yeah. No. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So obviously obviously, obviously you've retired from the sport. What, what, what's, what's can, like, can you can you can you see it in my face? Has my face gotten rounder? <laughs> it has it actually. No, you're, you're doing well. It's because of Ramadan. I'm fasting. That's why. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> that's one thing as well. Like, like, I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, obviously, there's going to be athletes around the world, like doing Ramadan as well. Like, how do you focus? Or how how do you how are you able to cope with the intensity of training? Because I can imagine the intensity of the training it's going to be the exact same if you're doing Ramadan. It's 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 difficult, man. It's a very difficult month for an athlete. Um, right now, as I'm not an athlete, it's yeah. it's it's a piece of cake. Like going like 16, 17 hours without eating or drinking, it's a piece of cake. But when you're doing it, when you're training twice a day, yeah. it's gonna be difficult. And it's just about you. The thing about it is you get through you're going to get through and the first day is going to be difficult and the last day is going to be difficult as well it's not going to get any easier because you're going to be pushing yourself even more and even more when your body's getting more used to it um but you need to think about like say the month after you finished or the in the days after you finished ramadan and you're able to eat and drink again think about how much like energy you've had energy you have now and when I went through it, I went through it, I think, three or four times, like um, three times, I think, uh, Ramadan while being a full-time athlete. And it was like literally one of the most difficult times of my life. But when you can get through that, you can get through anything. And everything just becomes, it just feels easier when, you, when you're done with it at the end of the day. And um, yeah, there's there's no way to sugarcoat it and say yeah, it's easy because of this because if you've got faith and everything it's it's not it's not easy man but um your body does amazing things like you can actually you can do this and um yeah and, and it, it almost builds like that mental toughness that 
if you can do it in that environment, as you say, when you get into a competition or training like, again, then you're going to have you're going to have so much resilience when you go to a competition. You're like, well, I done I done it when I was fasting, like, and I was still able to keep that intensity high. Why can't I do it at this competition and perform high as mm-hmm. well? It's like those little things, like. Um, it may be difficult to have when you're in that moment, but like afterwards, it, like you you realize the mental toughness that you build, which in a sport like this is probably what you need as well to be able to go from a competition, get knocked back, and just keep going and going and going mm. and persevere. Yes, it's a, it's a really it's a really it's a really good thing. Well, it's the thing the thing about it is as well that. A lot of people who don't do Ramadan but go through weight cuts do exactly the same thing as us. Yeah. So you're training while you're cutting weight and you need to get from 70 kilos to 67 kilos, for example, and you're starving yourself and you're not drinking and you're doing that and that, and it feels so terrible and it's so difficult. But when when you've stepped on that scale and then you can drink and eat again, you're going to feel amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to feel amazing and you're going to feel like, oh, okay, I've, I've, I've been through the worst of it. Now I can, Now I can do my best and I can, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's, it is something that like, I wanted to touch on because, like, just because of like, going through it right now. But like, obviously, there can be athletes coming up that are maybe struggling and they, they may not, I mean, obviously, like, in terms of like, sport, like, what, how it can like affect our sport. But if like, you turn any positive in that light, it's going to help you in the long run, which is what, what, there and then there's no positives in it like you literally there's it's so difficult to find a positive in it and you're gonna you're gonna hate everybody around you're gonna hate life and everything but it's just if you're doing it for the right reasons obviously I do it i do it myself because of faith and stuff like this it's gonna make it makes it like worth it in the end like you yeah yeah, no, no, it's, it's really good, and obviously you, you don't need to, you don't need to do that right now, which you're probably thankful for. <laughs> but I used I I used to I used to like lose like eight six to eight kilos in a month when I when I was doing it because it was like so taxing on my body. Right now I'm not losing anything. Like everything I'd eat, I'd 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 eat two three thousand calories afterwards when I break my fast. And, and I wouldn't burn any extra as well. <laughs> That's crazy as well, because obviously you're a heavyweight athlete, so losing that weight, like you were a, like when you're in a certain weight category, like, like the underweight categories, everyone's kind of there and thereabouts the exact same weight. Whereas in the heavyweights, you could go from 84 up to like 105, 110 kilos. So like that weight advantage, like, it, it can make a difference at times. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it's, it's easy. It's easy to get back though. Like weight that weight that you've lost. That's not actually weight in a way. That's just like water and stuff like this. It's very easy to get back. So it's not. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, moving on. Like you retired from the sport. What are your goals or your next chapters that you want to like write for yourself or what you want to like achieve? Um. Obviously, um, anyone from Norway who's listening. I'm not really gone. I'm going to be competing at national championships. You'll see me. I'm going to keep that streak going. Um, That's what I love. <laughs> just need to like prepare like a couple of months in advance and I'll yeah. be good. No, but um, I do uni. I do a sports science degree now. I finish uh, next year, next summer. So, um, yeah, ov- hopefully I'll start um, after uni, maybe start as a strength and conditioning coach or like physical coach for some kind of sports team. I don't know if it's going to be international in Norway. Um, Don't really know at the moment, but getting through that at the moment. um, And um, yeah, just uh, I'm also a a regional coach for like the regional athletes that I want to get onto the national team and stuff like this. So the younger people. Yeah. So I've got a couple of like um, um, squad trainings with them, like a couple of times a year, which is uh, which is my kind of way of giving back. Um, so they can have someone that they can look up to and see that it's not that difficult if you just put in, in the work. Um, and um, yeah, other than that, I'll, like immediate goals is like to get my 
to get my routines back in check, like we talked about uh, in the beginning, like um, to actually get out of this this dark loop of not really doing anything, like having those 24 hours a day where you're not actually doing anything that's of importance. So that's like my immediate goals and hopefully I can, we can talk about this like off camera. Um, you can give me some advice maybe of what you've, you've uh, gone through like, yeah. because when I, I remember, when I saw that YouTube video that you put out, um, which was not related to any of the challenges, but it was that New Year one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's 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 the video that it actually resonated with me so much. Like I was sitting there and I was like, "Wow, he's actually put into words exactly what I was been thinking." Yeah. But then you managed you managed to get action out of it. I didn't manage to get action out yeah. of it. Do you understand? But so, uh, um, th- 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 this is the thing that I think is athletes. Like, what what kind of known as like superhuman shall we say like we're expected to like perform at the highest level the full time like well maybe like we're not meant to like feel any like emotions we're able to just bypass everything but in reality we are just normal human beings who go through the exact same experiences that everyone else goes through we have the exact same effects and i i, 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 I struggled to put that into words like like but the reason i done it was because I knew there was so many athletes within, like even just karate as well, like specifically, like there's so many athletes going through the exact same thing. So like if I took the step from someone who's competing at the highest level and they're feeling these things, like it's okay for like younger athletes or like athletes as well, like they, they're allowed to feel those things. Like it's perfectly natural, natural, but also that you just it's okay to talk about it. I feel like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I feel like as athletes, we are like if we show like a sign of weakness or like we're ha- we may be feeling something, like people might be like, oh, Nick take his spot away. He's not in the right mindset or he's not he's not focused on this. But uh, these are I, things that everybody go through, and we've talked about like when we talked in the start as well, and I was going on about like how I was going through those those like feelings and stuff like that it's totally natural and i didn't i never shared it when i was fighting or whenever i was doing uh like a lot of like competitions and training and stuff like this because i never thought that like as you said i thought like showing kind signs of weakness is not good but um hopefully like someone's listened and they've been like okay yeah yeah that that, I i can relate this is like why I wanted to start this whole like podcast thing as well because I wanted to give athletes a platform of if they felt comfortable enough, they can talk about their experiences as well and just have like an outlet for us being able to talk about it, but also like the wider public be able to see it and take advice or like the experiences that we've went through and like it's mm-hmm. going to help them. Like that, that's like the main thing, yeah. We're just having a talk where like well reminiscing about all the great times but it's like there's like a deeper meaning behind it as well that i want people to like know that in sport it's okay to talk about how you're feeling like no matter if you're in the sport you're out of the sport like just talking through like it's it's going to help you and like there's people out there that they understand what you're going through and they can they can almost find a way to like help you through it give you the advice if you need it and yeah definitely yeah, but yeah, well, you'll probably be familiar with this. We'll finish with some quick fire questions. See if you cool. see if you can fire all them out this time around. Obviously, you never touched on it, but you were you were what a silver medalist in Kata. Yeah, back in the day. <laughs> so, what's what's your favorite Kata? Oh, Look at that. <laughs> um, favorite Kata. Um... To watch uh, Sansai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sansai, yeah. Uh, It's a good one. Um, And to do myself... Don't really do kata anymore. But uh, let's say what I did... Norwegian Championship Final. uh, I did um, um, uh, Kankusho. Nice. I I, 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 I want to see you do kata. I'm like... I've, yeah, I've, we'll, see. we'll I've, do that one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've taught Adam Carter when we were on Cyprus at Europeans and he done Anan. And it was 
it was the most amazing thing ever just to watch you do a cat. It's, it's probably the same feeling as watching me do fighting. Like you look like an absolute idiot. It's cool. It, but it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nah, but we'll we'll do it. We'll, we'll get to do it one day. We'll see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what's what's your been your most memorable tournament? Like it may not have been your best one or best performance, but what's been your most memorable one? <clears throat> um. Paris Open 2020, my cool. last ever Paris Open. Um, what was the reasons behind that? I had a quite a good performance. Um, I fought uh, some top guys. Uh, I fought Japan in my second round, and uh, I beat him three uh, nil. Japan obviously has been a World Games champion, World Team champion, whatever he's. Uh, in the top 10 of the rankings and everything. Uh, so uh, that's like one of my proudest achievements is that fight when I beat him. And uh, I had one of my closest friends was living at, in Paris at the time. So he was there to watch it and he could, uh, he actually watched me perform like at nearly at my best. Uh, I think that was at my best. Um, but yeah, I got a ninth place there and it was, uh, was quite, quite, I'm quite proud of that. Um, and I mean, uh, think that was very memorable like the way that I was composed and everything and I just wanted I, I could do whatever I wanted to do which was like it was a very good feeling so really no, like that uh, yeah no definitely because that, that's the thing you want as an athlete you want to have that feeling of like it's almost that like, flow state yeah it's that flow yeah. state where you you, you know you, everything is like comfortable for you yeah yeah which is rare to find. I, as as we spoke about, it's rare to find that. So if we could bottle it up and take it, like, we would, but it's so difficult to get. I, I remember like Lewis Hamilton talking about it. He's probably only had like maybe one or two races that he'd class as like a perfect race. So mm. it's like everything that he's achieved and like he would only class that as like two races. It's, it's probably the same as us. Like, it's difficult for us to capture that perfect performance where we are in that. So, yeah. Mm. What, what, what's, what's been your your favorite country to travel to? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Nice. Hong Kong. It's a beautiful country. When I went, it was um, the weather was perfect. We rented a, like a big boat. We went out on the sea and were there for a whole day and. It was just um, the training camp and um, yeah, shout William Thomas for inviting us over. It was um, it was very very good. What about you? Uh, favorite country? I I'd probably I'd probably say Santiago. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it just has everything. But yeah. uh, like it's got like, the hustle and bustle of like the city and all that. Like you've got amazing views over the city, but you can kind of like leave that and go like into the mountains and stuff like that like mm. yeah but yeah i wish uh, wish i could have gone i never went but hopefully one day that's that's the thing we'll we'll, we'll go we'll, we'll go why not yeah, yeah. Like, this, is, this is what I, i've been speaking to adam and chris about like even if like none of us are selected for dubai we should just go to dubai for no them. i'm going i'm i'm definitely going uh, yeah. you'll see me yeah, oh, yeah that is that is just like that is what i love to hear because I'm just going. I'm just going. I'm going. I'm going to yeah. rent a jet ski. I'm going to rent a car. <laughs> see, I was actually looking. To see, uh, what's the seven star hotel? Like, you know the one I'm talking about. It's like right by the beach or something like that. Yeah, the Burj, Burj Al Arab. Yeah, it's it's like a thousand dollars for like one night. But I'm like, what? What happens if like five people just <laughs> pay into the one room? That's like. 200 pound for like one night i'm like that'd be worth it say you've stayed in <laughs> <They're most famous. laughs> yeah why not <laughs> like stuff that i'm thinking i'm like yeah dubai you no, but I've, I've, I've actually i've actually told myself that world championships i'm gonna go i'm gonna go and watch yeah. just to be as just be a spectator I, not not being depressed yeah that's, that's what i was going to say do you think how do you think can you actually enjoy the experience of there's not been any pressure you can actually sit back and take it all in i, w I wouldn't be able to tell you yeah i have no idea <laughs> no idea yeah uh what's been first off who's been like your most memorable opponent you've went up against i like, was well, like you've went up against someone and you're like wow like, that's, like a good performance so, like, i'm glad i got that win 
Mm. Can we say favorite opponents? Yeah. Favorite opponents. Um, uh, heavyweight from Saudi Arabia, Tariq. Um, had a few fights with him, and um, it was um, yeah, really liked the guy. And um, when when I was starting out and uh, actually getting into maybe serious training and stuff, I saw that highlight reel of him from Jakarta when I became world champion as a junior. And I was just so impressed. And then I fought him two years later and I beat him in Okinawa and then had a couple of other fights with him where he beat me. And it was, yeah, man, I fought him like maybe four or five times. And yeah, my favorite opponent. Amazing. Because I kind, I, kind of, I kind of looked up to him in a way. Yeah. I was like, okay, I want to do this as well. That, that's so, what, uh, that was what my next question was going to be like. Who's, who's been like an idol or someone you've looked up to in the sport or like aspired to be like? Uh, I've never aspired to be like anyone uh, because course. I know, obviously, because I know that we're all different. But um, starting out, it was Enes Erkan, uh, heavyweight from Turkey. I would have loved to fight him at some point. Uh, obviously, I retired and became a politician. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I wish uh, yeah, that, that guy looked up to him. What what's been like your your funniest moments within the sport then? Um, well, there's a couple. There's a couple. We can um, we can take one of them. So um, Paris Open 2019. <laughs> you've heard about this. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going. You've sent me the footage. I'm going to ping. I'll the send you the video. <laughs> you're gonna put it. You're gonna put it up on the screen. So um, I'm fighting Kosovo, and um, <laughs> we've somehow mixed up that. I was supposed to be red and he was supposed to be blue or something like that. Obviously in the warm up area, I just saw him wearing blue gloves or whatever. And I put them on and I put on my red ones and then he just thought I was red. So we just, and then we, we started fighting, went out, started fighting long story short. And um, 20 seconds in the referee stops us and says, points at me, says, are you Kosovo? And I was like, no, no, I'm Norway. He says, are you Norway? No, I'm Kosovo. And then we look at the, the board and it's, and it's the opposite way around. So we get taken off the tatami and then in front of everyone, like Paris Open is huge, like a lot yeah. of support, a lot of spectators and everything. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, uh, I've done this before. I need to run back to the, um, uh, to the um, changing room and I need to get my uh, blue equipment and I need to get back. And the Kosovo guy, it looks at me and he's like, me, you change. <laughs> and he just starts taking off his things. And he's like, and he's a lot shorter than me as well. So I'm like, oh, I hope this fits me. And I'm wearing a belt that's this long on the sides. And we're standing there changing, and um, yeah, that was quite funny. Thank God it wasn't like the red and blue Premier League ease that you had to <laughs> imagine. How would that be like to them? <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we'll, 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 fin we'll finish it off. This has been a great note to finish it on. Like, what's one piece of advice, like message that you would have given yourself when you first started out, or that you'll give to like the, the younger athletes that you're coaching or something like that? That's like, if you implement this or if you do this, it's going to help you on your journey to achieve what you want to achieve mm. in the sport. So um, sports-wise, it's about trusting the process, that things don't come overnight and um, no one's going to give you anything for free. It's all going to come through hard work and uh, perseverance. And um, so it's about trusting the process. Like if, if you don't have a good day now, maybe you'll have a good day in a year or in two years or in three years. It might take a long time. I said my European bronze came after one and a half years of just yeah. constant lows. So um, definitely trusting the process, sticking to what your coach tells you to do and just working. Um, uh, when it comes to other stuff is 
you need to like cherish the moments like the experiences and uh all of this like it's not going to come around a lot of times like and if it does it's going to be gone once so now we haven't i haven't been out traveling for for a year or something i haven't been on a plane for a year which is very rare for me <laughs> but um yeah i didn't i didn't I, I i appreciated but i didn't appreciate it enough when it was there so appreciate everything that you're going through and uh, cherish the moments take a lot of pictures um take a lot of videos get to know people and um yeah trust the process because everything's part of it's just part of one 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 way towards a goal that's yeah. you're going to get to achieve in some way or another yeah absolutely love that it's good, great note to finish on I- yeah, as 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 something as athletes like they need to do, they just need to live in that moment, and it's a journey, as we say. Like definitely, like, that like, with anything in life, you're going to go through ups, you're going to go through downs. But if you want something badly enough, if you put in the hard work, the effort, the dedication, then you're going to get the result, no matter the process, the journey that you've went on. Yeah, exactly. So that has been real talk with Jordan Shafranik. Thank you to our guest today. Ishmael for taking the time out. It's really, really you, yeah, amazing to speak to you. Like, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to do more in the future <clears throat> as well because I, I feel like we're we need to do, we need we need to do some like challenge or something like this as well. Like, I need to get onto something like remember lockdown last year when you, when I had those maths things going around as well. <laughs> yeah, we need we, we need to do something, man. Just like um, some I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not anything like I'm not I'm not really on big on that stuff, but. Anything you do, like I would definitely love to do it alongside you, like oh, once. So happily. we can go and we can explore Norway or Scotland or whatever. We can go to Dubai, whatever. Like man, we need to. Yeah, like, no matter no matter where we end up, we're gonna we're gonna make memories. We're gonna it's gonna be amazing, and that's hundred percent. Yeah, that's the best thing. So thank you, thank you so much for thank having me on, and uh, it was a very it was a pleasure. Appreciate it. We'll catch you in the next episode. Cheers, guys. Peace. We'll